Hi friends. They call me host Eric. And with good cause, after all. I am the host of Talking with Famous People. And as you can see, I've got a very spooky Octobular background going on today. As I decided to... I got this cool loop of... Well, I got this cool footage of these leaves blowing down the sidewalk here uh, during a lightning storm the other night. And... Uh, Rachel and I were watching, and I said, she were, when we were watching it, like, this would be a really cool, like, 20-second long video, because the lightning goes off at the end and everything. Um, and then when I went to, to say, okay, I need a different sunset picture today. I need a different sunset picture of the background. Hi, Winston's mom. Um, I remember that conversation Rachel and I had. And maybe I should move this a little bit over here so you can see the lightning better. <laughs> um, Rachel, Rachel and I watched this in the comments about it, and I thought this would be an interesting thing to see if, if basically to see if OBS and YouTube can handle me streaming something like this that's got two videos going on concurrently. This may be a little difficult for you on your end as the... Uh, as the receiver of the data stream here because it's probably a little thicker with information than it normally is. And it would be with, say, a uh, still image in the background. But, nevertheless, I thought this was a fun thing to try. And the topic today is something that I think Winston's mom's going to be interested in. I've thought some about something she's mentioned before when I've been thinking about this the last couple of days. Some time, long time ago, or maybe a medium time ago, Winston's mom pointed out that the thing about astrology is whether you think it's nonsense or not, human beings have been using the heavens as the only unchanging map for all of human history. So, if you, if our cognitive function frames, when we're thinking about mapping and or reality mapping and or experience, in other words, communicative things versus experience, we're talking about identities and explanations on the one hand, and we're talking about phenomena on the other hand. So, from the ancient people's perspectives, just as from our perspective today, what they desperately wanted was a reliable map that would allow them to anticipate things. For all of human history, it's not been the case that people want to have things unchanging, right? It's not, it's not like people want, gosh, I wish that, that every winter were exactly the same, you know? I wish that every winter were exactly the same. No, it's not people don't wish that. They just wish that they would be able to anticipate in advance this upcoming winter is going to be a really hard winter. So we need to prepare more for it in advance. Now, the heavens above proved to be the only thing in the human realm that was absolutely predictable. In other words, the, the single one only things that were absolutely predictable were above us. They were never at ground level. So... It's like the moon was predictable. It went through the sky and it went through this cycle of you could see a big circle, a little bit smaller of a circle, a little curvy thing, you know, <laughs> and then nothing and then a little curvy thing and then back up to a full circle again, you know. So that was completely predictable. And they discovered early humans, ancient peoples discovered that there were other elements about the um, heavens that were equally predictable. If you weren't at the equator, that included things like the solstices and the equinoxes. And so you had people basically trying to render the immutability of the maps of heavens above into the experience of humanity below with things like, like ancient 
rock things where only on the solstice does it the light shine straight through this hole. Like in you remember in Indiana Jones when the sun has to go through this thing and it lands on this pole this go shoots through this prism at the top of a pole and then it points to where the treasure is buried or something. Well, they have a lot of that shit actually in the ancient world. It's just not to point you where treasure is buried and stuff like that. It's just like for no reason except to hey, we've noticed that but like there's this there's this place somewhere in Mesoamerica where uh, they have these multiple rocks carved out so that on particular notable days of the year, like solstices and equinoxes, the light does exactly that. It go, you can only see the inner part of it illuminated on certain days. Or like Stonehenge is another way. Right, the light shines through like a clock. So... It makes a whole lot of sense then that if you're trying to have maps that provide you better predictive power about the future, but you're trying to map things that aren't really subject to very clear predictions. So, in other words, <clears throat> whether or not the sun is going to be a big circle or half a circle is incredibly more predictable and on a whole different level of thing than who's going to win this battle, right? And that's a much more challenging thing to predict. Of course, from the general's perspectives, they would love to have as much certainty about their... Hi, Jonathan Bisanti. I just wanted to mention to you, you said a lot of really good things during the live stream. And I only read like one of one thing you said out loud. And it wasn't because it is the case that if I don't read your shit out loud, it probably means it's not grabbing my attention enough, like to to just find me reading it out loud. That is not the case with all the shit you said the last time. I just did you know, it's like when I'm responding to one thing, I'm sometimes just not looking at the chat and therefore not noticing things. You just happen to slide out from underneath my notice, every one of those great things you said. Otherwise, I would have read them all aloud. Um, so, so what you end up having in the ancient world are people who are trying to bestow the certainty of the heavens upon the uncertainty of the earth in a variety of different ways. Why are comets so so hugely important in as far as omens in ancient people's understandings well because they represent a variation from the one thing we know for sure the heavens don't change they continue to go around in the same way <coughs> cyclically and then all of a sudden you get a comet in the mix it's like <coughs> well if we've got if we now have a piece of experiential indication amongst what historically has always been consistently map stuff then um <coughs> then you know um <coughs> we're gonna think the map's telling us something you know it's like it's a natural thing to think if the if the place we go to for identity and consistency and binary. Basically, the heavens are binary and the earth is spectral. So, um, when you get a comet, all of a sudden you're getting spectral action on a binary plane. And it's, it's dramatic. It's going to mark something significant. When you, when you get, uh, an eclipse, similarly, right? So, the thing is, Humans knew for sure that the heavens were telling them stuff that they could reliably take to the bank. That the coldest part of the year happened um, on between the equinoxes on that side, you know, instead of this side or whatever. Uh, and that, that the time to plant would be, yeah, if you were going to do agricultural ancient peoples. Or if you were talking about hunter-gatherers, 
then the time to find the antelopes near this place is, is when the heavens are like this. You can reliably establish the, the repeatability of things that are cyclical on point in nature with things that are cyclical on on uh onto the world or whatever I was saying. I got distracted by Winston Bomb's comment there. What are we congratulating people about? Oh at least passed her Paralegal exam. You finally qualified to earn yourself a husband. Oh, wait, no, that's not what you do that for, huh? You guys like my cool background? <laughs> it's pretty cool, huh? It's leaves and trash blowing along the old Kmart. That used to be a Kmart, that building right there. It's now, I don't I think it's empty. It's just waiting for a new tenant. And then lightning at the end that's a great 20 seconds of video it's a great 20 second loop yeah it is it really puts you in the mood for halloween doesn't it um well encountering jack likes to uh give me a lot of pushback about that hello like your vehicle may be at risk of losing coverage. In order to prevent your extended warranty from expiring, I am giving you a courtesy follow-up call. I don't have an extended warranty. I don't even have a non-extended warranty. I bought the car used, quote-unquote, as is, you know, with no extended warranty. Although, I did have to take it back to the dealership like a week after I bought it because it was broken. And I assumed I was fucked because I got it as is. But the FE tool user I was with at the time didn't think that was okay. And in fact, she was right. On FE grounds, they they had no problem fixing it. They, they didn't give us any pushback at all. I accepted on, on point what I had agreed to. When I drive off this lot, all problems are mine. But that's not actually how it turned out to be. <laughs> Yeah, they are so thorough down there at the extended warranty branch. I tell you, they they've got some really good people there, making sure they get everybody alerted to their to their extended warranties. So, <clears throat> when you think about the relationship in general between explanations and phenomena, we we can at least conclude that for all of human history, people have sought to uh, people have sought to have explanations for things. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not shitting on Encountering Jack. I just mentioned he gives me a lot of pushback, you know. And a lot of times, I think that I have good answers for his his challenges, but that those answers don't really satisfy him. So that's how that is. Um. So, the thing is, if you, at the same time, there's, there's, some, there's some sense that, by some parties, that not everything has a simple explanation. So, for some parties in the ancient people's times, everything had a simple explanation. If one of your family members got struck by lightning and died, it was because you hadn't um, given it enough offerings to the god or something or it was because he had blasphemed or it was you know because a witch had cursed him or something like that right there was there are people there have always been people who want to have simple decisive identity based explanations for everything and the reality is some things are very well suited for identity based explanations like that and some things are very poorly suited for them um, when we talk about individual human beings 
we are trying to explain two different things concurrently when we're talking about personality. We're trying to explain why this phenomenon occurs. In other words, why was Jody so mad at me when I told her that dress made her look fat? She asked if it did. I answered her honestly. Why would she be upset? You know, that's an example of somebody looking for an explanation for a specific phenomenon that's occurred related to a specific other person. On the other hand, a question like, why can't Jody ever remember um, these conversations we had in the past? I say, remember that time we talked about Nya? What was his name again? Why can't she ever remember that? That's a different kind of question, right? It's a question about um, phenomena rather than a phenomenon. And it's really a question that skips, that skips a step, right? So what accounts for repetition of the same phenomenon is, is the step it skips. And it goes straight to Jody's a person who's, who is bad at this, who fails at this, who fails to uphold this standard or whatever, right? Why? What's wrong with Jody? It goes straight from, from noting a repeated phenomenon to what's wrong with Jody? <laughs> because, of course, if it's not within our frame of reference as to how people ought, what the norm is for people, then we try to understand what's wrong with the other person. So it's like um, when when Cloud used to be around here and he used to say provocative things that were wrong, make, make provocatively wrong claims, then I'd correct and then he'd just shift to another provocatively wrong claim without really learning anything about the previously provocatively wrong claim he had made. A and naturally... I was thinking, what is wrong with this person? Like, why can't they communicate properly, right? And he's probably thinking, what's wrong with this person? Why can't he just accept that truth is instrumental, that we use it to have a conversation right now, but we don't have to stick with it or anything. It can just change tomorrow. I could be this type today, this type tomorrow, this type the next day, blah, 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 yeah, right? So he's somebody who, uh, who's very attracted to identity-based explanations, but he's not somebody who's distinguishing between things that, need identity-based explanations or are suited for them and things that aren't. And he doesn't understand that identity-based explanations are, are semi-permanent. That once we have a good explanation, we stick with that until we have reason to challenge that explanation or think that maybe it's not a good explanation. So let's read some things here. 500 years ago, someone had an epileptic spell. They were called possessed. Now we understand their brain hardwiring went wonky. Well, I still believe in the possession theory, actually. I think the people with epilepsy are demonic. That's why I uh, always carry around with me wooden stakes and silver bullets in case I encounter an epileptic. Oh, an actual... That's why. Yeah. Otherwise, they might... It's contagious, you know. They can give you demonic possession, too. But that's one of the rare areas where I'm sticking with the ancient peoples here. Usually I'm I'm with the modern scientists, mm. but not regarding epilepsy. For good reason. For plenty of good reason. Have you met many people with that epilepsy? No, never. But my point is this. I've never met one. My point is this. If they weren't possessed, why would they be all like, you know? <laughs> good point, right? Yeah, that is a that's really a good point. point. <laughs> because, like... The only other place where I see people writhing around like that is at, like, you know, the church. The church, yeah. And that's when they're speaking in tongues. Yeah. So, basically, what I've concluded is that epilepsy is a form of speaking in tongues that's not legitimized by Christ and therefore is demonic. This is good reasoning. Good sound reasoning. Okay. I think we project our own ideas of an archetype, a friend, a wife, a father onto them and then try to shape them into our image of the perfect form of this archetype. 
I mean, I think you probably do that. <laughs> I think you're doing it right now. <laughs> like, you're projecting onto everybody else how you are a knower first, right? So as a knower first, that probably makes sense. And as a universal knower, like, uh, you probably understand people as their roles before you understand them as their, as your experience of them. But um, I, I really don't. So you would think that Eric's going through the, through the world constantly typing everybody that he's encountering if you're an NI person. That, you know, when I deal with a clerk or something, I'm likely to be, I wonder what type they are. or But I almost never is. Almost never is that the case, you know? Sometimes I'll, we'll encounter somebody and I'll go like, God, what an ESFJ or something, because we just get heaping piles of FE poured on us or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's normally when I'll note it, is if, some, if, if somebody's too, giving me too much subject FE, I, I don't need you to be very, uh, well, hello, how you doing? Are you guys doing okay over here? Yeah, I just don't need that. Okay, I just it, it's not terrible. I don't hate it or anything. It's just like okay, enough. This isn't data that I care about. Um, why does this type of math being astrology persist when predictions consistently prove to be no better than random guessing something about human nature? Well, legends fall. It's because of this the the two kinds of things that people map. So, if you're trying to explain a phenomenon then cognitive functions lets you do that, but astrology really doesn't. Astrology ex explains instead the identity kind of thing. So like I was talking about Jody before. Jody's a friend you have, and she can never, every time you go, remember that time we were talking about this movie and you were saying how you went there with Steve, and what movie was that? She can never come up with the answer, okay? Every time you do that, she can never come up with the answer. And so you've, You've concluded not simply that this is a, a repeating phenomenon, but that it's an identity quality of her of Jody's. And you're probably right. Well, what astrology does is it tries to only address the identity labels. And so since those are determined by which phenomena you're noting, which repeated phenomena you're noting, and attending to, and that there are so many phenomena that occur that depending on which ones you gather together and draw a circle around, it's going to look like a very different person, right? So astrology allows you to, to say, these circles that I've drawn around these phenomena are explained by the fact that I'm a Virgo or whatever. And then there'll be a description of Virgo as being comprised of things within of those circles, right? Of course, the reason it's not a meaningful explanation in terms of of something that other people can like what what makes cognitive functions distinct from it is the fact that I can say, here's a test so that I can convert this descriptor of multiple phenomena with a circle drawn around them into a, a stimulus response phenomenon. So if I, if in fact Jody is a Virgo, maybe, maybe being very forgetful, consistent with being a Virgo, but there's no way to distinguish between Virgo and Sagittarius on a forgetfulness test. Whereas there is a way to explain forgetfulness in a way that links to other qualities. Yeah in very predictable ways, although not in, it, it's always in, a, in like a, if meow, then either meow or meow kind of thing, rather than if meow, then meow. Yeah. Okay. So it's like if, F, if SI polar, then either uh, T-E-N-I or, or F-E-N-I. But those two things are, are different, but, um, but nevertheless, you can, you can say, they definitely won't be, they definitely won't display certain qualities of, say, a deliberator in the first slot. They definitely won't display certain qualities of, say, an action type in the first slot or a knower in the first slot if they are as bipolar.
this phenomenon is most easily expressed with if somebody is an extroverted intuition dominant, then they're either really good at the TI questions or really, really bad at them and nothing in between. And so it's like, uh, you know, at that point you get something, get down to something that's very simple to explain and other people can test as well. You can check to see if extroverted intuition is in the one, two pretty easily, especially if you're an extroverted intuitor yourself, you can do it because then you can set up the extroverted intuition test you need to, to do. You can compare against yourself, right? <laughs> so you can set up the extroverted intuition test to determine one or two. And then if you get, if you, you're dealing with somebody who's clearly an extrovert, right? You don't even have to worry so much about slotting here. I'm obviously going to, you know, both an INTP and I are both going to be probably pretty reliable in terms of self-reporting about whether we're extroverted, more or less, or introverted. Same with ENFP and INFP. I don't think there's going to be too much of a challenge determining the difference between extrovert or introvert. So once you determine any is in the one, two, and you determine extrovert, then you can make a concrete prediction and test. Okay, I've determined you are any one. That's as locked down as I can get it. Now let me see if Eric's right. Do some TI questions. Either the person's going to be, bam, rock solid, quite dramatically good at them, or bam, horrible, practically blind to them, and nothing in between. And if you can show me examples that contradict this, then you've falsified the model. So the, the point is, that's what makes astrology different, is that it doesn't have that that part it doesn't it, it it's just a way of mapping conceptual identities that may or may not be useful for for various people in various ways and the reason why you can't determine what's the correct interpretation of of astrology versus a less correct interpretation of astrology is because there's no there's no way to establish that phenomenological link so <laughs> If you're if you're always if by nature you're you're dealing with these non phenomenological things like um, astrology typologies you know set labels stuff like that then things like what Rachel used to do which I I don't think she really does this anymore but what she used to do which is look the, ask the tarot or look to astrology for answers as to whether she and I were compatible now. That's like a jogger checking his GPS to make sure he's still moving. It, it, it's uh, you you don't need to check your GPS and see the dot walk moving along to know that you're still running, right? Um, the point is, astrology would like to to be able to determine whether somebody's a runner or not without ever actually checking if they're actually running right now. And that's the difference between um, typology and uh, and astrology, okay? But, but but the main reason I brought this ancient people's things is that, uh, you know, we can we can understand so much about about the world history itself through cognitive functions so you know when when certain understandings or explanations of things in the ancient world occurred we can explain them in terms of overutilization of a mapping or underutilization of a mapping paradigm and we can distinguish between which which kind of mapping paradigm, you know? So before I continue any further on this topic, can I just once again point out, hey, what a cool background I have. I filmed this film the other day, and when it was the lightning storm around here, of these leaves blowing down the sidewalk towards the camera, and then towards the end of the clip, it's a 20 second long clip. The original was like like four minutes. I clipped this 20 seconds out of it. The original has a section where I was over there and the section, anyway. 
but it's a 20 second long loop. Is this in Temple City? This is right near where I used to live for forever, where the whole first few years of this channel were from. This this is very close. I could easily have walked to this spot from my old house on Sultana. Um, it's by the where the old Denny was that burned down. So I don't know if you remember this story, but um, shortly after, like either right before or right after I moved out of Temple City uh, to Laverne, the Denny's that I had been going to in Temple City, which was very close to my house, that I had been going to since I was 16 years old. I have a photo of me sitting in a shopping cart outside of that Denny's when I was 16 years old. If you'd like to see the photo, it's available to be seen in this video I have called uh, Everybody Hunts for Stories. I forget what it's called. But it's it's like a, a video which uh, the the video part of it is just made up of of pictures of me and my life from way back. It's sort of like a it's the song and the video is a, a SI nostalgia kind of a thing or whatever you want to call it. I don't know. Um, so. When, as soon as I, from when I, the moment I got my driver's license, I had been going down to that Denny's. When I first went there at like 16, 17, I remember when I first started smoking, it was probably, I was 17, 17 and a half to 18, somewhere in there. You could still smoke inside the Denny's. They had a smoking section, you know. <laughs> That's how long ago that was. And we'd sit there and smoke and drink coffee, and the waitresses were probably really annoyed with us because we just order coffee and smoke and drink coffee. Um... But I've been going to that Denny since I was 16 years old with friends and by myself. And prior for the, the couple of years prior to it burning down, I've been going there for my one meal a day when I was on my on my full blast, like um, Adderall thwackage time. It would be I'd get up, I'd get all thwacked out, I'd work all day on various things, or just be on the internet talking with people, etc. And then, like, at 1 in the morning, I'd realize, oh, my God, I'm about to pass out. And then I'd walk or drive myself over to that Denny's and have my, like, 2 a.m., 3 a.m. Uh, dinner. I always hated Friday and Saturdays because uh, if you went there, like, a Tuesday at 3 a.m., there's nobody in there, and you can just have a nice, relaxed meal. If you go in there on, like, Friday at 3 a.m., it's like, okay, all these drunk people are making so much noise. Anyway, um, that place... As soon as I moved out of Temple City, right when I was moving out, either like the day before or the day after or something, that Denny's burned to the ground. I thought, wow, what a crazy, what, how crazy is that? Well, of course, naturally, if you're a human being who's inclined to see connections between things, there's something magical about that. If if my story is front and center in the overall narrative of the universe, then there's definitely something magical about that. Of course, in reality, it's just a coincidence. There's been God knows how many people have gone to that Denny's, right? And the fact that it was important to me and it's burning down happened to coincide with when I moved away from Temple City is it are all just things I'm adding on top of the phenomenon. They're mapping things unrelated to the phenomenon but related to me and the thing towards which the phenomenon occurred so we can see that happening throughout human history it's like if you're a king of england and you see a comet you think that comet's about your upcoming battle against mia but if you're a farmer in mesoamerica you think that comet's about your upcoming harvest one way or the other. You know, it's like, so, if it is a magical omen, it can only be a magical omen of uh, for one person and one thing, right? It, it, otherwise, it would have a bunch of contradicting magical omens. Or it would be an omen of everything to everybody, right? So, historically, the way people have dealt with that is to essentially say, well, the heavens operate in conjunction with I, our mortal understandings of hierarchy. If the heavens are going to bother to give us a comet, then 
they're going to, I mean, they're, they're not necessarily, they don't have to contradict, uh, but if, if it's an omen for everybody, you necessarily will have plenty of contradictions. If each individual is, so in other words, if two competing generals are both viewing it as an omen of their victory, one of them is necessarily wrong, right? So it is, it is conceivable that every person who creates an omen out of an event may create a distinct and non-exclusive omen. It's highly unlikely. Why are you calling me a dunce? <laughs> um, what did I say that was dumb? I mean, the thing is, it's like, if, if I did say... Joker, the you dunce, the Joker movie for an EGP movie villain. Oh, I see you're talking to Brandon. I don't think that I don't think the Joker's an EGP. I've never thought the Joker was an EGP. I think the Riddler, you might call the Riddler an EGP. Um, he's much more much more correctly deemed an EGP than than the Joker, I think. Uh, but. ENTP villains, hmm. I mean, the thing is, you don't get to see a lot of ENTPs, real ENTP representations in, in film. I mean, most, most types aren't super well represented in film. To be in a movie, if let's say you're either the hero or the villain and you're an ENTP, chances are they're affording you a lot more TE clarity than you actually deserve to be afforded. So it's like Iron Man's often called an ENTP. No ENTP is going to be that good with the TE shit, with the TE tech stuff. And it's like, you know, I, I one time there was there's somebody on the internet who wrote this sort of futuristic post-apocalyptic story uh, in which each of the characters in it is is just a personality type. So INTP, blah 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 blah, ENTP, blah blah blah. And I really thought that their their explication of the ENTP in this story was was just right. So the ENTP in the story is the guy who gets the who gets some half assed version of the internet running again. But he doesn't do it by doing anything himself. He understands the framework here, like what we need to do in order to get this accomplished, and he engages the right people and he tells the right people his ideas. And then they have the actual capacity to convert those into some sort of reality. And he sort of brokers deals with a couple of different people. And then they have this, this really half-assed, you know, shitty version of the internet. And he's like, champagne, everybody. And they're like, but what about all these bugs? And he's like, eh, you guys will figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> that's your ENTP, okay? Whoever wrote that story nailed it. They totally nailed it. It was, and of course, this happened right after, at the last minute, the ENTP decided he wasn't going to go to China after all. So, it, that, that, you know, it's like, I, I don't remember who wrote that story. I wish I could link to it. It was pretty fun to read. I, um, I've just read the ENTP part, I think, if I remember correctly, the ENTP and the INFP part, because the INFP part was right before it. And they had like, like, the INFP had some sort of magical power where, like, if you hurt their feelings enough, they could disintegrate you. And they did, but they always felt really, really, really bad about it. <laughs> so, um... Oh. I see. Josh, Josh 3 says, ENFP... Joker is an ENTP in INTJ NIFI Jumper Shadow. Oh, I see. Well, that makes sense then. I mean, <laughs> if only there were a way to tell them apart from a real ENTP or a regular ENTP. How would you be able to tell apart, though? I guess it's just, you gotta have the instincts. You gotta have the eye for jumpers. Um, INFJ movie villain. There are, I, there are some INFJ movie villains. I need to think a bit before I come up. Well, I would say the the guy in the show I'm watching right now, Three Percent, 
is probably an INFJ movie villain. What was it? What's his name? Um, Esquivel or something? In what? In 3%? The main, the, the process oh. director? He's got something like Ezekiel. Ezekiel's his name. Ezekiel. Ezekiel from 3% is probably an INFJ um, villain. Super. Uh, main main villain guy. INTJ villains are a lot easier to to find in movies. Like you would probably call um, the Sith Lord the guy who's shocking Darth Vader at the end of Return of the Jedi, and and the OG Sith Lord. Oh yeah, yeah. He's shocking Luke, and then Darth Vader gets in between him and Luke, and he starts shocking Darth Vader. That guy, he's an INTJ. Um, you know, it, what's funny is I think that the most, the quintessential INTJ every that you see is in anime. You can always tell when an INTJ has written an anime. Okay. When an INTJ is written in anime, the basic premise of the anime is always this. The protagonist has figured everything out already at the beginning of the show. Okay. He's so knowing and so no so N I T E that he's anticipated everything and has figured out how everything's gonna play out at the beginning of the show. But you don't know that as the audience yet, okay? It gets progressively revealed as the show goes along. So, like, I w I've been watching Battle Game in five seconds. The the protagonist is an INTJ um, or an INFJ with great TE, one of the two. <laughs> he, seems, he actually seems more like an INFJ in his affect. He's like an INTJ with no FE problems. So, um, and the other, the other guy is also an INTJ on the other team, the, the mastermind guy. And there's this whole series of ridiculous, well, you thought you outsmarted me, but actually, I outsmarted you, because I anticipated you were going to do X, and now I'm doing Y. And then the other guy goes, well, actually, you think you outsmarted me, because... I did do X, but I knew you were going to do Y, and that's why now I'm doing Z. And then the other guy goes, well, actually, you thought you outsmarted me, but you did X knowing I would do Y, knowing you would do Z, and that's why I'm now doing A. And it's like five levels deep, you know? Um, that's, that's your classic INTJ anime fantasy, is for their NITE to completely understand all of the processes as objects of analysis well enough that they can actually predict how human phenomena play out across time. And that's the bugaboo of, of INTJs throughout human history, is they fail to account for the variability of, of human illogic, and so their ability to mastermind is constrained accordingly. <laughs> Yes, you're stalling. You'd like to think so. <laughs> so, it's like, you, you get to see that in Death Note, which INTJ is typically, like, that's their favorite anime, is Death Note. That's the classic example, but I, I see it in lots of, I, of, of animes. As soon as you get that really, like, silent guy who's never making mistakes, but isn't really effy out forward, then... Then you know. You you got it. <laughs> you know that there's gonna be the battle of the masterminds going on. No, I haven't. Um It's hard to do superheroes and villains because they're so so casually written. Um most of them. Like like I was saying about uh, Iron Man, he's often typed as an ENTP, but no ENTP is that good at making shit in the physical world. I mean, to be an expert at making shit in the metaphysical world means you have to be not quite so good at making shit actualized in the physical world, you know? Um, uh, 
Anybody want to get rid of these trolls? I can do it, I guess. So, um... I'm sorry, Jasaf. We're trying to actually have a adult conversation around here. So... I'd rather not play play with children today, if possible. I'm just not really in the mood, I guess. Why don't you and Jesus Lord go play someplace? Um, if Jesus is Lord, does that mean that Lord is Jesus? Are Jesus and Lord subject to the commutative property? Okay, so, um... So of course we have we have various parties projecting their various frames of reference onto the world via their assorted narratives. Of course, one thing to remember is that who's much more likely to be making narratives throughout human history? It's going to be, of course, the intuitives, uh, the people who think that communication matters are of great significance rather than so much experiential matters. As we enter into a time where sort of education becomes democratized and there's this notion of free public education and that the problem is the reason we have so much idiocy in the world is that people are undereducated. Well, <laughs> that's wrong, right? Instead, what you end up doing is giving people who are unqualified just enough information to hurt themselves basically so if i teach you how to argue but you aren't capable of distinguishing between things that are mapping matters and things that are experiential matters and then you end up being somebody like peter singer or judith butler or where it's like they they have stories to tell but they're telling the wrong kind of stories because they've only been given the tools that are useful by certain kinds of people, I and mean, in their hands, they can only hurt themselves with them. You know, it's like... Basically, don't give a thong bikini to a man. It's going to hurt his nuts. You know? <laughs> I have Capricorn rising. I do. I love my Capricorns. You know what I like more than anything else? is a fresh piping hot ear of Capricorn on the cob. I just eat it like this. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, you look excellent. I'm, I'm not saying... Look, Jonathan, you and I both are extremely, extremely alluring in a woman's thong bikini. But it's painful for us. That's all I'm saying. It, you know, women are used to this. I'm going to wear these horribly uncomfortable <laughs> shoes, even though they're, they're horribly uncomfortable because they make me look good. Men aren't so used to that. Um, you know, we don't normally walk around with our balls in a, in a vice grip. Not normally. It's worth the pain to be fabulous. Well, you know, there's a lot of people who agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not one of them with my SI fourth. Uh, I... I, you know, it's like one of the biggest traumas of my life of, that I can remember lately was the night I wore the wrong shoes oh. to an event we were walking to. That was awful. I had a very painful spot on my foot. And I was foolhardy. It was a foolhardy SI mistake of mine. Thinking, ah, it's not that far. I'll just walk in these shoes, even though they're not very comfortable. Because it's a fancy occasion. I should be dressed up. Well, I had to take them off when I got down there. And fortunately, I had brought a spare pair of shoes. Didn't I? Yeah, you did. Which is really weird. It's like, why would you have even walked in those fucking shoes if you have a spare pair of shoes with you? And you, you know moron. What? It was like 
everyone totally understood like the pain that you were in like no one everyone was like oh good he went back to change his shoes like good like who wants to be uncomfortable in shoes at like at an event it was just and with your if you're si fourth you have a very low ability to pleasantly tolerate discomfort mm. Um, I could not get my mind off the fact that my foot was hurting with every step I took. And so, you know, it's like, uh, that's the kind of SI mistake I used to make at an even bigger scale than that all the time. Just thinking, oh, well, I'll figure it out as we go. But with SI stuff, you can't figure it out as you go. Once you've left the hotel and you're halfway there walking, there's no... Dude. There's no figuring it out. You know, you no. either dealt with it properly to begin with or you didn't. And so, I don't know what that's about, how I got onto that conversation. But whatever I was trying to illustrate with that, consider it illustrated. <laughs> Do you know that Spe the Speedo Corporation, famous for their Speedo swimsuits, that only 3% of their total sales are actually what we would normally call Speedos, those little underwear bathing suits that men wear in, in Europe. If you go to a European beach, just just resign yourself right off the bat. You're going to see a lot of guys in Speedos. Because the European guys, they don't quite get how gay that is for some reason. I don't know. They don't. They think it's, it's like normal or something. <laughs> they do. It, but it's not. It's not normal. <laughs> it's just not normal at all. I have never owned a Speedo. I will never own a Speedo. I would never be caught dead swimming in a Speedo. You know, I believe um, Speedo is a Australian company. I recently learned that. Isn't that interesting? I, I don't know what country it's from. I, I, I think it's either Britain or Australia. I do know that because I did read about the company oh. just the other night, but I don't remember oh. the country. Um, but... Uh, yeah, but yeah, but but the actual speedo swimsuits only comprise three percent of their total sales. Most of their sales are, are like, um, I guess maybe those caps you put on, or like the ladies' version of it, or bathing suits they sell, or well, regular yeah, bathing women's, suits. I, I'm women's, not, I'm not totally. sure what else they would be selling exactly, but I, that surprised me. That really did because their brand is only famous for being those that particular male underwear looking swimsuit that's black usually and says speedo on it but that's not all they sell they sell lots of other stuff i guess i used to have a speedos women's bathing suit i'd like to see you in a speedos men's bathing suit oh that would be interesting that would be interesting that would surprise everybody at the pool <laughs> <laughs> you say i'm identifying as a man today <laughs> I'm not top. It's fine for me to be topless because I'm identifying as a man today. You can tell by my speedos. Nobody would complain. No, nobody. With, your, with your big old titties, nobody would complain. <laughs> Everyone would be like, good, glad to see you. Come on over. <laughs> Welcome. We are so pleased to see you here today. Your, your swim teacher wore a red one in swimming class in seventh grade. Definitely edgy. Hi, Lauren Cuthbert. That is edgy. You know, just yes, <laughs> all of yesterday, I was sobbing. And Rachel kept asking me why. She said, I haven't seen Lauren Cuthbert in such a long time. So, obviously, I've been missing you, too. Um, I'm getting you through life. Well, that's good. Yeah. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, that's something. If you don't get through it, how will you get to the other side? Right. That's what they they say. You got to go through life to get to the other side. Yeah, when you're in it, go through it. You know, we had swimming class in high school too. Uh, like you're talking about having it in middle school. We didn't have pools in middle school, at my middle school, even though it was a fancy middle school. Like Foothills is not a poor middle school, and it has it has two different levels of full size sports fields. So. It's got, it's, it's right on the mountainside. So it's, they like tiered off a level of football field up here, soccer slash football. And then another one down here with a full size track around it. This is a middle school, remember? And then it, uh, it had various supporting, all the various supporting equipment like 
you know, goals and um, shoots the field goal through it thing, uprights, and uh, and stuff like that. And then we had we had uh, lots we had volleyball courts in sand pits, and we had volleyball courts on cement too. But there were no pools at Foothill. It was a fun place to go to middle school if middle school could ever be a decent experience for anybody, which it wasn't. But <laughs> uh, because like one time, my friends and I found a snake up on the side of the mountain there. Because it, right against, it's like that top field. It's just the mountain right here, and then the field. And so it's like, you know, they tell the kids, "Don't you? You're not allowed to climb up the mountain." Probably now they got a fence there or something, right? But it wasn't like that when I went there. It was just, you can't, you're not allowed to climb up the mountain. And generally people didn't. But, you know, you climb up it a little bit if there, you saw a snake or something. We caught a snake that was a fairly large snake. And we tried to convince, I think we tried to convince the PE coach to let us take it home. <laughs> <laughs> and he wouldn't let us. We had to let it go. It was like a big corn snake or something. Um, wow, you caught a snake? That looks scary. Uh, it, it was not we knew it wasn't we knew enough about snakes though it's okay. like uh we knew what kind of snake it was and we knew it wasn't poisonous and so oh. we we were like excited to see it that's cool in fact i remember there was some sort of some people were saying it's a king snake which and the rest, the rest was like no it's not a king snake because california king snakes are really rare and it wasn't it was a it was either a rat snake or a corn snake or something like that um because like, we looked it up or something later to make sure. Because there was an argument about what kind of snake it was. <laughs> but we knew enough about snakes that we knew it wasn't a poisonous snake. Like, the only poisonous snakes around here are rattlesnakes. And they're very easy to distinguish from other snakes. It's good to know. I did try to catch a rattlesnake one time. A baby rattlesnake. This was when I was an adult. Like, you know? <laughs> and eventually, I, uh, I was like, you know what? Eric, because I was trying to like sort of get it with two sticks or whatever, and it was like, ksh, ksh. I was like, okay, Eric, just stop. What are you doing? Stop fucking with this rattlesnake. <laughs> so, you know, I hear these things are really valuable if you can if you can catch one. I was in my twenties, but you could sell them for a lot, which I think is true. Actually, I, I believe that it may. Or I believed it at the time. Maybe it is true. Maybe it's not. But that's why I wanted to catch it. But uh, I ended up figuring um discretion is the better part of valor as they say if it's red on yellow it's a good bell it's good to know jeremiah fix and elise like i feel like that too like dude she says dude rattlesnakes can swim slash skim water it's ter it's terrifying like yeah. Right. But I tell you, if if I were ever going to get poisoned or something like that by something around here, it would definitely be a black widow. The the most likely opportunity anybody in Southern California has to get poisoned is by a black oh. widow. There are a lot of black widows and there have been a lot of occasions in which I've like picked up a log or something and gone, Ah, ah! There's a black widow right there. <laughs> so it's like that's happened a lot of times to me in my oh life. Oh my gosh! If if I were ever going to be bitten by something like that, it would be a black widow. My mom was bitten by a scorpion, and in fact, she wrote a, a beautiful story about the whole experience, which I've, I have a video of me reading aloud, I believe, somewhere on the channel. Um, because when she was a little girl, the researchers at the University of Arizona in Tempe. Uh, would pay children a nickel apiece for scorpions because they were doing basically like research with the venom for some reason. And so there was this particular like, from the way my mom describes it, it was kind of like a, a rest area maybe. And it had these, these huts in it that had, instead of real roofs on them, they had just like lashed palm fronds onto there. And she describes how she and her friend would go with a long stick and they'd go up to those roofs and go Psh -sh 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 -sh, and then all these scorpions would would fall would fall down onto the ground and then they'd scoop them all up in jars 
And in fact, they had a story that that they told each other that the least dangerous scorpions were the mama scorpions with a bunch of babies on their bottom. And the reasoning they had was because the mama had to give up all of her venom so that each of her babies could have a little bit of venom. Now this makes no sense at all, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> But that's what they believed. Yeah. They, she never got stung by a scorpion during all of her myriad scorpion collecting wow. endeavors, which she used as a as a business, basically. She and her friend would gather a shit ton of scorpions, sell them to the, the professors at the university. Can you imagine being a professor and going, and somebody asking you, uh, Dr. Stevens, so how are you acquiring all these scorpions? Oh, I've got some little girls collecting them for me. <laughs> Yeah, so I, got, I found a couple of seven, eight-year-old girls. I got them out there gathering scorpions <laughs> for me. I'm paying them a nickel apiece. It's a lot cheaper than hiring adults, believe me. <laughs> Can you imagine? It's fucking hilarious. Oh, cool. Can you, can you hook me up with a brownie, a brownie, a scout troop of brownies to go to go gather? You know, pit vipers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking. To, I'm looking for some pit vipers. We, we get a whole troop of little girls out there <laughs> dealing with the most dangerous things around. <clears throat> Anyhow, she never got stung by a scorpion during her scorpion collecting, but one day she was over, going over to that friend's house and. Um, her mom was like, well, hold on. She's not done eating dinner yet or something like that. And I guess my mom, like, kicked a, kicked a box that was there, just sort of, like, impatiently as she was waiting. And she got bit by a scorpion. She was stung by a scorpion on her foot or her ankle or something. And she describes how it was just incredibly painful, how the father of her friend scooped her up and ran her across the street to her, her house where, you know, her mom put her in the bed, and her mom was a pharmacist. My grandmother was a pharmacist, so presumably provided some sort of treatment or whatever. Now, scorpion bite, scorpion stings don't kill people, I don't think, usually. But uh, apparently it's extraordinarily painful. So, uh, you know, and, and then I, I, I think in the story, my mom indicates that... But this, she may have just been taking artistic license here that the, the scorpion that stung her was, in fact, a mama scorpion. But I suspect that's just for sort of literary completeness. I can't imagine they bothered to check what kind of scorpion it was after it stung her. Although they might have if they thought it was relevant to, like, if some kinds of scorpions are more poisonous than others. But I don't really know much about this scorpion subject as a subject in and of itself, so I don't know. It's pretty daring. You'd catch cicadas and put them on strings and let them fly around. I don't know. We don't have cicadas really around here, I don't think. No, I saw two this summer, though. Oh, you did? Mm hmm So, from what I'm understanding from the chat here, apparently the way to get chicks is to act as gay as possible. This is, this is surprising news to me. Because <laughs> I'd often heard things that would seem to contradict this in the past. But, uh, I guess... Well... I guess that means I must be acting extremely gay because I got Rachel. Is that what you're trying to say? That I'm super effeminate? I have excellent fashion sense. Today I've worn red. Why? Because I want to raise awareness. And I think Rachel and I actually do want to do a, a live stream about this or a video about this. This happens to be Mental Health Awareness Week. Now... When you talk about awareness weeks and shit, um, I always think, God, I hate this. Whatever it is that you're talking about. If it's diabetes awareness, if it's, you know, special needs awareness, if it, I don't care what fucking you know, breast cancer awareness, whatever kind of awareness it is, I seem to never have any skin in the game. So I'm like, fuck these awareness weeks. I don't want to be more aware of shit. You know, I'm aware enough. However, in this particular instance, I feel like I have a horse in this race. Like, hey, it's Mental Health Awareness Week. We have awareness about mental health. We, we have experience together, Rachel and I do, dealing with mental health issue. And uh, 
and I do actually care a lot about it. Like, I feel that one of the one of the big things in society that needs to be addressed is that is is this. People believe mental health problem makes ad hominem not a fallacy. In other words, well, we can discount everything that this person says because they're crazy. It's a big fucking problem. Rachel encountered this for a long time, a lot of years, where she was trying to explain to people what the problem was and which solutions were working and not, and she wasn't even afforded legitimacy on her own self-evaluation metrics, basically on the grounds that, well, she's crazy, so nothing she says matters. Now, of course, because these fucking idiots, I mean, the thing is, she may have been crazy, but they were stupid, and that's much more likely to make you wrong. You know, it's like, and, and unlike Rachel's craziness, their stupidity can't be cured. You know, so it, it, even when Rachel was at her most psychotic, I did not encounter her lying to me or purposefully misrepresenting things. There were a couple of moments when she was at her absolute most psychotic, when she was saying things that were detached from reality completely, like she mistook me for her ex-boyfriend, yeah. Billy, for a little while. <laughs> that was at the very, the very lowest spot, right? Yeah. Um, but, uh, but the thing is, what needed to have happened early on is for the mental health profession to meaningfully include their patient as part of their process. Uh... And they didn't. They basically said, well, we're the, we're the professionals. We know what reality is. And we know what's wrong with you. And we know how to fix you. It's like, how many years were spent trying to... If we could just get Rachel to finally stop quitting smoking pot, then what? Well, then she'd be really surly and pissed off until she started smoking pot again. <laughs> But from their yeah, perspective, yeah. somehow if they could if they could just get her fundamentally to be different about this, then that would resolve things. Uh, it never did. It had nothing to do with it ever, right? But nobody listened to her because, well, what does she know? She's crazy, you know? So it's like, as far as mental health awareness goes, I will say this. People who who have never been diagnosed with a mental health issue, a real one, like, not, I'm not talking about ADHD, let's just exclude from this conversation entirely two things, ADHD and autism spectrum. Just exclude those. Also exclude um, oppositional defiant disorder. Oppositional defiant disorder is the most bullshit thing I've ever heard of in my life. So, antisocial disorder indicates that a person is doing harm to others, violating rights, committing crimes, or otherwise being a malevolent force in the universe. Oppositional defiant disorder is what some stupid person would diagnose me with because I won't agree with them. And it's nothing more than that. Um, basically, if you're a smart teenager who calls bullshit on stuff, you will get, uh, you will get diagnosed with oppositional defiant disorder. You're obviously not doing anything wrong or else they diagnose you with antisocial disorder. But doctors who want who want to not have their frames challenged wanted to pathologize people who, who say fuck off. And that's just not okay. You know, so let's get rid of those kind of stupid things. ODD, ADHD, um, autism spectrum. And let's talk about actual mental health things. Things like schizophrenia, bipolar mania, things that that result in some kind of psychotic break at some point. Um, the, the number one thing to remember is this. What I got to see from Rachel is that whether it exists right now in, in this moment in time for your particular mental health issue, if it's schizophrenia or something, it's different from bipolar mania, right? But whether or not a perfect solution exists for you right now, a perfect solution exists that will cure you and leave this not an issue ever again, unless the cure stops working or something, right? So the problem that a lot of people have in their thinking about mental health is they see it as a an ongoing chronic thing. Like, this, okay, well, you are 
crazy. This is going to be a problem for the rest of your life. You're going to need to engage with mental health professionals about it for the rest of your life. Not if you engage with a good one who will solve the fucking problem and then you'll have a meeting with them every six months to review your medication levels or something. Yeah. You know, that's how it should be. If you're not having that outcome and you've been diagnosed with a serious mental health issue, then you need to continue fighting to find the right doctor because the right doctor made all the difference in the world uh, in Rachel's case. Yes, completely. I was on the wrong medication for a very long time. And I do believe that's why, you know, like... And if you'd like to know who the right doctor is, I can give you a referral right now. His name is Dr. Ingram. Dr. Ingram. Yes. He will he will cure you. He's a great, great doctor. I uh, I can tell that he actually really cares about me and Eric and our well-being. Um, and uh, it's made all the difference. It really has. I've never been so stable for such a long time. Now, there are various studies and data that purport to show a link between marijuana smoking and uh, exacerbation of certain mental health problems. I would posit that probably to the extent that 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 data is legit in terms of establishing a statistically significant deviation from the mean, then it's probably a bunch of people like Rachel who, who are exhibiting increased mental health problems associated with marijuana smoking because they're not afforded legitimacy in their own agency regarding it. So it's like, it's the people pushing back against it that cause the statistical linkage between pot smoking and exacerbating mental health problems, not the pot smoking itself. That's what I would suspect is a better explanation. But even if it were the case that you could establish some statistically significant linkage between pot smoking uh, and worsening mental health uh, symptoms, then um, it it would only be it would only be meaningful in the context in which the thing wasn't cured, right? So it's like before Rachel was being treated. And it was better than her being untreated. So she was always varying between almost not crazy at all and almost too crazy. <laughs> and then uh, if she, when she stopped taking her meds, it went too crazy, right? In that context, conceivably, you might get a result that shows marijuana exacerbates mental health s symptoms or something like that. But, of course then the data would still be meaningless because it's just indicating that when when the mental health field has done a shitty job of treating somebody, other things have bad impacts on them, potentially. But when they've done a good job of treating, it's not even in a question anymore and there's no reason to test for it. Because Rachel's perfectly fine. Nobody thinks, oh, maybe she shouldn't smoke pot. Well, why? Because there's nothing to exacerbate because she's cured. Even if, even if, so even if they were right about exacerbating it, focusing on the exacerbation means not focusing on the thing that matters, which is curing her, so that it's no longer an issue. Of course, it's not the correct about the exacerbation. That was just an even if argument. But even if it were, my point would still stand. TI tool equals ODD, exactly. No, you do need to justify yourself, and that's bullshit. Okay, you're just a po you're being oppositionally defiant. No, you're being stupid and it's way more offensive than my oppositional defiance. Yeah. <sighs> Obstinance is being projective about objective truths. That's an interesting thing to say. In other words, you can cling to some objectivity regarding the the specific claim you're making, but you're using it in a way that's really just designed to project your frame of reference onto others as the normative good. That's an interesting thing to say, Jeremiah. A lot of times you say things that confuse me and, or that I don't understand, but uh, I do understand that, and what you're saying is, is a very... I don't think it works as a universal rule, but it's a very neat notion. I like it a lot. 
I think the criminalization of cannabis <sighs> leads them to be more paranoid when the when they partake. I.e., the cops are going to come. Well, that's true. I, I mean, I remember back in the day being a teenager having those moments, being like, oh, "That was a cop. You think they're looking at us? You know, we're inside my friend's house or whatever, <laughs> and the cop drives by outside, and you go." <gasps> Did somebody call the cops on us? Because they smell marijuana. on. You know, I've had those moments. But, um, I mean, the thing is, this reminds me of the occasion recently when I encountered a volunteer collecting money for D.A.R.E. outside of Smart and Final. You know, I don't remember what D.A.R.E. stands for. Drugs. And... Yeah, education. And I said to them, I'm like, are you, are you hungry? Uh, would you like to contribute to this? You know, like, do you have an ex an organization that dares to keep kids on drugs? You know, it's like, that's what I, I don't remember what I actually said. I said something snarky, you know, and, um, and she's like, actually, you don't know, listen, we, we've really changed our, we've really changed the focus of our program. We're now all about suicide prevention. Okay, dare. <laughs> um, the thing is, how many people who went through the mis misinformation program that I went through growing up by Adair, when I had the cops come to the school and tell you all these lies about drugs, how many people who heard over and over again in elementary school, middle school, and high school that if you do drugs, you're a loser, internalized those narratives rather than rejected them? How many suicides have you caused, Dare? Why would we trust you to resolve the matter now, since you're the source of it in the first place? Of course, if you've got a, a predominant cultural narrative that seems to be winning the frame of reference for years and years and years, that says you can't both do drugs and be considered legitimate in society, then you're going to cause people who aren't free, who aren't capable, who, who don't by nature parse things themselves, in other words, who aren't TI or FI tool, you're going to cause them significant problems because they're having to factor in the, the importance of other people's perspectives regardless of whether they're correct or not. I don't have to factor in other people's perspectives when they're not correct because I just say, well, that's just wrong, so whatever. It's like, um, Corey came over the other day and I, w I was like, he was like, you're so, you talk so openly about this shit online. I'm like, well, yeah, because I'm not doing anything wrong. So if the cops want to arrest me for, for smoking DMT or something, bring it, motherfuckers. I want a jury trial. And if I get, if I get put in jail, well... I mean, I, I have to live in a world in which I assume that in an accountability form like a court, the correct arguments will win. And I do operate in that frame of reference. And if I do lose, well, then that just empowers me with even better arguments. It's like people don't understand what Obi-Wan Kenobi was saying when he's like, if you cut me down, I'll become even stronger. The reason they don't understand it is because in that context, it's completely fucking bullshit. There is no way in hell... Obi-Wan Kenobi was more useful dead than he would have been alive, okay? That's not necessarily the case with the situation I'm talking about. If, in fact, some overzealous prosecutor, especially in around L.A., were to decide to prosecute me for some drug crime because of something I, some drug I did online, um, well, that would be a wonderful opportunity to take what are true conceptual identities and render them true into a phenomenological frame of reference. So, in other words, if they are going to put me in jail for that, fine. But they're going to have to listen to me first. And that is, that is something that I almost never, ever, ever get to have. Almost never is it the case that anybody who needs to hear me is forced to listen to me. In fact, the people who most need to hear me are the ones who least want to and run screaming when I start talking. So, it's like any threat to take legal, you know, criminal legal action against me is also a threat 
to give me the chance to be heard by the people who most need to hear me in a forum where they can't silence me and everybody has to sit there quietly and listen, or at least pretend to listen, right? They, they're, they're promising to afford me an environment where I can ask questions of witnesses and they have to answer. And if they don't, the judge will tell them to answer. They have to answer on point. They can't avoid the question. They can't slide around and, and pretend like they answered it when they didn't. So, um, the threat of, of, you know, filing criminal charges against me is much, much exponentially less powerful than it is against anybody else, pretty much. Because I know I'm not doing anything wrong, so to the extent that I'm doing something illegal, the law is wrong, and then it needs to be held to account. Nobody's ever going to hold it to account properly but me, really. I mean, there are other people, but... Not that many. Most people don't want anything to do with the legal system. Most people certainly are not going to want to have to go to a trial and risk more time in jail rather than just take a plea bargain for blah, 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 blah. Most people don't operate in a frame of reference where they're as free as I am to actually seriously indulge the idea that, oh, well, I might get charged with a crime and that's not, bad. That's not a bad thing because I haven't done anything wrong. You've got to be very spoiled to have that frame of reference. And I am very spoiled, so, you know. But, you know, my biggest problem is, yes, it is true that I can grow weed here without consequence. And yet, I still buy weed from the store. Because why? Because it's like, every time it's planting time, like, I don't have lights, and I don't want to try to grow with lights. It's a pain in the ass. So it's like I, I got to plant in spring and then harvest in, in, in fall. Or plant in early summer and harvest in fall. But it seems like I never have any seeds right around planting time or something. Rachel and I have, have grown a plant and harvested and smoked it. But I planted it like in like this time of year. And so uh, it went straight to budding. It didn't get very big. And um, it was good, but it didn't get a lot of harvest, a lot of yield off of it. You know, the one time I did it properly in Temple City, I got, like, pounds off of it, you know? I'm not, not a full two pounds, but over one pound. Which is pretty good. That's a, a fair amount of weed, you know? <laughs> <coughs> I'm talking about dried weight, too, you know? Of course, the cops in Oklahoma stole a couple of ounces of it. And you know what's the worst thing to imagine? is if, like, after the cops stole my weed, my guess is they didn't even smoke it. It's like, if you're going to steal my weed, at least smoke it. Don't just throw it away. Maybe somewhere in Oklahoma there's a state trooper who's got my stainless steel bong and the last... The last scrapes of a few ounces of weed he stole from me a couple of years ago. Maybe. And the thing is, if you remember, I don't know if people, people in California may remember anyway, all the arguments that happened before the the pot legalization thing happened. And one of the big, bigger ones was always, it's going to bring crime to neighborhoods because people go to these weed stores. It, nothing of the sort has ever happened. Um, weed store customers are so much less shady than liquor store customers. People don't loiter around weed stores. Weed stores have security and they shoo them away. Now, you might say, well, the reason weed stores have security is because of all these concerns about crime and stuff. Well, yes, it's true that weed stores have a lot of sort of high value product that makes them potentially a target for robbery, but that makes them like just about every other store. It doesn't make them distinct in any way, you know? Um, it certainly doesn't make them distinct from, say, a pharmacy. Now, 
pharmacies obviously have a lot of security uh, and liquor stores don't. Of the two things, which is more likely to correlate with crime, liquor or weed, liquor obviously by a large margin. So, you know, none of these supposedly risky things that go along with, with having a weed store in your town have ever manifest for anybody. And especially not if it's a white market weed store. The white market weed stores are... They, they reflect the character of the neighborhood. So the one that Rachel and I go to in Pasadena is quite boutique -y. You know, it's like... If you went in there, you would say, Oh, what a lovely little dispensary boutique. They've got like all the, the products they have in these glass cases. It's a fairly open floor plan. You can walk around looking at the glass cases of the things. You can't smell things because it's a white market store, which means you they, they're not allowed to scoop weed from a larger container into a smaller container. They have to have it all sealed up and tested and everything before they sell it to you. So there's no way to, to smell the stuff. But what I've, what I've determined is Smell is not a good way to determine whether it's good weed anyway. It just isn't. It's usually misleading. Stuff that smells the best is obviously sativa, is often sativas that aren't really that stony. You can tell a lot more about it um, by looking at it. So I hope this background is putting everybody in a Halloween mood. Yeah. Because it's seasonally appropriate time here on Talking with Famous People. This lightning that you see in the background of me striking occasionally is actual real life lightning that I captured on film while filming these leaves. That is not me. There are no CGI effects in this, okay? Did you get a wind advisory yet? It's pretty, pretty windy out. <laughs> It's a good question. Last night, Rachel and I were were discussing the matter of wind advisories. So we had left the house yesterday. And I was like, what's this orange exclamation point on the weather thing? And I clicked it. And it indicated that there was a wind advisory. Now, <clears throat> when I first received the wind advisory, I said, Rachel, it's not really windy enough to advise me about it, I don't mm -hmm. think. I don't think I need to be advised about these gentle breezes. <laughs> but as we drove around and we left my immediate house area, it turned out that it actually was quite windy. And then we, uh, we discussed what would be... Well, let me finish telling the story about the wind advisory first, okay? What would be a good... A good like Saturday Night Live skit, possibly, or or a scene in a movie or something, where somebody's looking at the front and says wind advisory, and they go, "I wonder how I wonder who decides to issue a wind advisory," and then it's like, one day you know six hours earlier or something, and then it shows there's these these scientists, and they're they're in a room with like a table with like charts and graphs on it and stuff, and computers, and and outside of the window, you can see one of those things that spins around with the wind. Okay. And, um, you know, one of the guys, they're all dressed like in like 50s, 50s guys with like thin black ties and pocket protectors and like, like 50s JPL workers. Um, and one of them's like, Johnson, it's looking like we're, we're looking at 30 to 50 here. Ste and the other guy's like, Stevens, are you sure? All right, let me call it upstairs. And then somebody runs down from the second floor. What are we looking at, guys? Blah, blah, blah. Oh, Jesus. We're going to have to call this upstairs. And then they finally get to the top two guys in this organization. They come down. They each have, like, a key around their neck, you know. And they have to stand separately uh, apart from each other and turn the key at exactly the same time. And then opens a panel in the wall that says, Wind Advisory. And it's got a, it's got a lever. And they, go, and they look at each other. This is it, gentlemen. And like the lights go off and it's just red blinking lights then. Wind advisory, wind advisory, <laughs> wind advisory. Because of course, I bet a lot of people imagine that's how they issue wind advisories. <laughs> <laughs> 
but probably it's just an algorithm. If the phone notes that meteorologists somewhere have said the winds are likely to be 30 to 50, they issue a wind advisor. If it's likely to be 40 to 60, they issue a wind warning. If it's likely to be you know, 60 to 80, they issue a uh, wind panic. <laughs> Oh shit, they've issued a wind panic today. <laughs> I am excited to see how windy it's going to get. I mean, I, I agree. Else, uh, Elise S. says hybrids are the best for, for her. I, I'm also a hybrid fan um, as well. Uh, when asked Indica or Sativa, I always say hybrid. <laughs> but the fact is... Hybrids are a bit of a crapshoot because sometimes you get a really sativa heavy hybrid and it's got that vinyl tubing taste and you go, this is basically a sativa. Does anybody else know what I'm talking about? Vinyl tubing weed? Good sativas, sativas that are considered, you know, are, are sold as like, oh, this is a good sativa, quote unquote. They often, with a couple of exceptions, the main exception being Jack Herrera, but, um, with a couple of exceptions, they mainly taste like vinyl tubing. They smell like varying things, but they taste like vinyl tubing. And what I mean by they taste like vinyl tubing is they taste like the way vinyl tubing smells. Like if you've ever sucked air in and out of like an aquarium tube, that's vinyl tubing that's new that you haven't actually used for your aquarium yet, the air kind of tastes like vinyl tubing. That's what good sativas usually taste like. And it's not actually a terrible taste. It's not like burning vinyl tubing. It's like unburned vinyl tubing, you know. Um, but uh, but the best sativa, I think, is Jack Herrera or Super Jack. And that has its own distinct taste. It's Jack. It tastes like Jack. And it, there's no other weed that tastes like Jack Herrera. And... Uh, and it's by far the best sativa, but like finding some place that has Jack Herrera or Super Jack, which is like, I used to go to this place that had this stuff called Super Jack, which was basically a couple of different strains of Jack Herrera, a couple of different instances of Jack Herrera bred with each other to make, you know, like the better instances of the same strain, you know? Um, and I, that was my favorite. It was tasted super good. It was stony. It was, it was everything a sativa should be, plus some of the things an indica should be. But um, you just almost never see it. White Widow. Uh, I mean, like, we got White Widow as a free gram with this deal that we got a while back when we, they had these Claiborne eights on sale where you get a free gram of white widow with them and the reason they sold those the reason it came with the free gram of white widow was because the white widow was quite good but it didn't taste good it 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 was like kind of nasty tasting actually um I, I mean i wouldn't not in a bad way like there's something wrong with it it just it just had kind of a a gross aftertaste compared to compared to all their other good weeds that they sell so it's like they had grown this strain of White Widow that was quite stony and quite good, but had a low sale pot potential because it didn't taste good, and people were going to be like, "I don't like that. I don't like the way that tastes." And if you're not if you're not really a, an experienced weed expert, um, then it's hard for you to tell how stony something is. Like I can always tell how stony something is uh, because I, it takes. It takes something quite stony to get me high at all, really. And I have so much experience smoking different weeds that I can tell after one bong rip whether it's good weed or not, basically. You're you're a, an expert. What do they have? What's the name for an expert? An aficionado. So are you, Rachel. Okay. Thank I mean, you. You've since you've been with me, you've smoked exactly as many different strains of weed as I have. That's true. And, uh, and, you know, Rachel's the world's greatest expert on one specific vector of a weed. How coffee a weed is. How much does the weed make you cough? Well, you can, you can learn a lot about a weed's coffiness by watching Rachel smoke it. 
she's going to cough no matter what. <laughs> yeah. But um, if you watch her pull a few bong rips in a row, I can definitely distinguish between coffee weed and not coffee weed based on how much and how frequently she coughs. If she coughs every single time she smokes a bowl of a certain weed, then it's then it's That's, on the coffeeer side. Yeah. And it, hey, Lady Lou, so happy to hear you mention Northern Lights. Uh, that's absolutely my favorite vintage you know, heirloom strain. And it's mostly a sativa. Uh, I mean, I think it's known as a sativa, but it's, it's not it's not a pure sativa. But um, Alaskan Thunderfuck is, is fine. I, I've had that plenty of... I've had that a few times. But uh, the thing is, Northern Lights... Uh, when, I, when I grew weed in Santa Cruz, I grew 11 plants, and one of them was Northern Lights. And... It and all the weed was good that, that I grew, but the Northern Lights was epic, and it was it was the best weed that anybody had ever smoked who, who smoked it. It's like the, the there was instant huge demand for all that I had, and I kept some for myself and I sold most of it. But uh, it was it was absolutely fantastic. It was the best weed I'd ever smoked at the time, and I. I, it was just like, oh my god, this this weed is incredible. Um, and like I said, all the weed I had grown was good. There wasn't any bad weed, but the the Northern Lights, the one plant of Northern Lights, which was smaller than all the other plants, but the weed that came off of it was, I I, I wish I could like have a nug of it that had been, you know, flash frozen, and I could try it now and see if I if I would still be as impressed, or if I'd still be impressed by it. But at the time, it was like, what the fuck? I didn't even know weed like this existed anywhere or anything like it. It was, it was, and, and everybody's reaction to it was the same. The thing is, I didn't grow by myself. There was a guy, an ENFP guy, actually, now that I think about what type he was, he was almost certainly an ENFP. And he was the one who had, who did all the TE stuff, basically. He had the pots, the dirt, the seedlings, the lights, I had the spare bedroom and the ability to water the plants every day. And so we split 50-50. And that's why I did so well in the growing part. Is he also would come over and say, okay, now is when we fertilize. <laughs> and and here, I brought you this squirt bottle of um, carbonated water. I want you to squirt this on the leaves before they go to sleep at the beginning of the budding cycle because the leaves will absorb the carbon dioxide from the water. Which, is that true? I I don't know. It sounds like ENFP bullshit to me. But I did it. <laughs> but I did it anyway. I, I followed the instructions. His name was Ken. And he was, he was like a, like a fifth year senior, six year senior or something. And I was a, a sophomore. And I, I, I knew I didn't know anything about indoor growing. So I was happy that I was happy to learn from him, you know. I don't I don't dab much. We don't buy much concentrate. Uh, do you still have that pen? Yeah. Do you still have any concentrate? Yeah, I actually. Can I have a hit off of it? Yeah. Yeah. So I don't remember when we got Rachel when we got this for Rachel, it was we decided at some point I don't know, maybe I suggested or maybe she she thought of it or something, but I I was like, you know what, you should have a pen. Because there's a lot of times when we're going around places, I'm smoking cigarettes. And I know that Rachel's like, uh, you know, she's she's what you would call a mirrorer. So she prob it probably prompts in her some thought of smoking. But of course, uh, it's not if you're smoking bong rips, it's a little bit more challenging to pack and pull a bong rip while driving around than it is to smoke a cigarette. So we got one of these for her with... Uh, uh, a little cartridge here of, of concentrate, and do you know what which which kind this is? This do you is remember? The Jack oh, this is the Jack Herrera concentrate. Yeah. So they had Jack Herrera as a concentrate. So uh, is it on? Yeah, it is. Okay. And I got to remember, this is not DMT. <laughs> do not yes, hit it like no. DMT, or you will fucking right. cough your lungs out. Yeah. And I was smoking DMT like I do my pen, so I wasn't really like 
getting the full effect. Um, <coughs> as concentrate pens go, that's not very coffee. It's it's quite mild as concentrate pens go. But I find concentrate pens generally make me cough quite a bit, so that's not saying a whole lot. Anyway, I would love to grow now here, but um, it's not the right time of year. We did this last year where we started growing like now, and then we ended up with this small plant and got a little harvest from it, which is still worth it. But, you know, basically, if I for me to... to to grow, I first have to, I know I have some seeds somewhere, but I have to find them. And so, uh, that kind of gets in the way of me ever starting the process because I'm not absolutely sure I'm going to be able to find them. So I first have to commit to this, uh, state of looking, of looking for something for a long time that I may or may not be able to ever find. So if I'm enthusiastic about planting weed right now, I can't actually plant weed right now. I have to do this first fine thing thing which i don't like so that's why you know i i just need to get some seeds basically or some or some uh clones because there's a store in la around here not around here but over there that sells nothing but clones How, it's called house of clones i think um or something like that cool. castle of clones house of clones something like that so I just need to go get some clones, and then I would, uh, oh my god, your roommate put your bong in the w dishwasher? That's a rookie mistake, isn't it? Uh, I mean, I suspect this would be people, fine. This would yeah, be fine in the dishwasher. would be. Because this is very thick glass. But you know what? doesn't matter how thick it is. I still managed to fucking break the thing. It's supposed to have another tube that comes out here that this thing slides into that's broken off. And I just push this here and it kind of sticks from all the resin. And it works okay. Uh, when I'm... If we had good weed right now instead of this shake and keef that we're smoking, uh, and Rachel were asleep, I'd probably start using her bong. But, that's good. It's good. Uh, rather than having a share bong, which is annoying... I'd rather just use this kind of bong. not perfect bong when she's out here with me. But you know, I, I think it was very, I had a really interesting conversation yesterday with, with light bulb actually about her experience having a relationship with an ENFJ and how like he basically wouldn't let her sleep <laughs> if he was up. Um, and bored, he always want to engage with her. Well, that's a big difference between going out with an FE dom and an NE dom. When Rachel goes to bed, you know, I, but also I'm an SI person, so I have, it's this. When it's certain times of the day, like now, and I fully expect whether I sort of, I, I just mean, without, expect without, Without any indication of like uh, normative quality to it, but expect that she's gonna be here sitting next to me the whole time, and or we're doing stuff together the whole time. We're never apart when we're both awake, basically. And uh, sometimes when we're both awake, I'm working on stuff that that doesn't include her. But uh, usually when we're both awake, I'm either if I'm gonna be doing YouTube stuff, I'll be live streaming probably, or making a quick video in response to something maybe. Or, but most of the time, we'll be watching TV or uh, movie or um, sometimes my my videos. She has uh, a gentle tolerance for my re-watching myself <laughs> that somebody who's going to go out with me kind of needs to have because I periodically do that. You know, um, yes. That's something that I learned with uh, being friends with Jen. I'd never met anyone that like liked to repeat certain things, like, and I noticed it in you, and it's created a patience. Like, you know, I just know it's you. That's that's your function stack. Yeah, and the reason is because. 
old PB. By and large. Thank you for gracing us with your presence. By and large, I'm comfortable in a state of non-knowledge. And as a consequence, when I want to know something well, I need to watch it several times because I'm trying to know it with SI. So I, again this morning, watched the second half of the 30 long, 30 minute long video I put up, I think it was yesterday, called Host Eric versus Other YouTube Typologists. I watched that thing probably three times now in full, plus making it, maybe even four times. And the reason is because it's taken me that many watchings to feel as though I know it. What, is, what do I mean by feel as though I know it? That I could articulate to you a succession of, of how it goes. So it's like it starts off with me reading this email and then stopping at a couple spots to comment on things that they say. And the first thing of note that I, I comment upon, if I recall correctly, is... Uh, Oh, is the the fact that he mentions these these movies? They're like, if I were going to talk about these movies, and you didn't know anything about them. I'd feel like I was talking with children. Of course, I, I didn't know anything about them, so I, I made some sort of little notation of that. Uh, the first thing I commented on, and the second thing I commented blah blah blah. If, so, in other words, if I were to start watching that video again and realize that I'm ahead of it consistently throughout the whole thing, in other words, I'm. I, oh, I know what comes next. Oh, I know what comes after that. Okay, I know what comes after that. Then I'm no longer interested in watching it because now I know it, right? But that video's taken me a long time to know, more than usual, because of its of its structure. It has a structure to it of sorts that follows from a plan of sorts of how to get from A to Z in, that I sort of went into it with. But... Uh, and it doesn't feel it doesn't feel like a an uncomfortable structure. It doesn't feel like a poorly a poorly executed video in that I'm sort of rambling on tangents here and there. It does feel like it's following a clear course, but I can't really articulate what that course is. It, it starts with this email, and then it uh, it proceeds forward with conclusions from that, talking about a variety of different things related to that. So it's hard for me to know. I, I even still feel as though I could probably watch it again. Because I don't know it. And, and I also think it's it's good. So if, if I don't know something, if I know something's good and I don't know what it is, I want to keep experiencing it until I know what it is, basically. And so um, if something's bad and I know it's bad, I don't want to experience it at all. And I have plenty of videos that I think of as being bad videos, even if... They, plenty of other people have good reason to call them good videos because they 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 don't have the capacity to entertain me. So if I do a good thorough TI explanation of something and articulate a bunch of TI shit and a lot of explaining this very dry analytical explaining, it's a good video on some frame of reference for some parties looking for certain things out of a video. It's not, in my mind, a good video because it's boring to me. I, I can't watch it. I can't watch it without being bored by it. I already know all those things that I'm telling myself, and I don't feel like this explanation is elucidating anything, and I'm not being, I'm not being charming in ways that charm me, you know? So, what's there to like? All right, so let's see here. Jeremiah, let's, let me let me go to the chat and read some things in the chat. Uh, and so, Jonathan Basanti, when they put me on Mount Rushmore, it is going to be just like this. They're going to have my hand here with an immortalized flame and granite, <sighs> lighting an immortalized bond rip, also carved of granite, inside of an immortalized bowl made of quartz to appear like it's glass. Where's the weed? Here. Silly Eric. Alright, now, what the government, yes, what the government doesn't tell us is that those were, that, that's originally how it was designed, but 
They ran out of granite. What is GI like Polar? How, how are you and Trisha? What is GI Polar, or how would I accidentally irritate someone who is TI Polar? How would you accidentally irritate someone who is TI Polar? You just have to say things like, but that doesn't make any sense because meh, or didn't you just say meh and now you're saying the opposite? Things like that will irritate a T.I. Polar person. You're, yes, I said that, but I didn't mean that. You're not getting what I mean, okay? What I mean is something that you'll agree with. And you keep disagreeing because I'm not using the right words, maybe. But that doesn't mean I'm not right. Even though I have no reason to think I am right. Because if I did have a reason to think I was right, I'd be able to articulate it, and I can't. Nevertheless, you're not getting what I'm meaning. Despite the fact that you're understanding my words just fine. That's <laughs> that's T.I. Polar person being irritated by Eric. You're not getting what I'm meaning. You don't mean things. Words do. Yeah, is what I typically yeah. say in response, you know. What does this mean? Buccaneers removed their former Super Bowl winning head, co head coach from their ring of honor. Wait, read that again. Buccaneers removed their former Super Bowl winning head coach from their ring of honor. What's going which, on? Which former Super Bowl head coach was it? Um, this one. Oh, uh, that's freaking Gruden, right? Yeah, that's Gruden. What happened with Gruden? I don't know. I forget what his first name is, but his last name is Gruden. Does anyone know? Host Eric, you know what could be interesting? What if you reply to some of the commenters who here who fly under the radar but often have smart, insightful comments? Your Patrick video is fascinating. I, I agree with you. It's, it's a worthwhile thing to do. I should do it more. Yeah, um, it's always useful to have something specific to respond to or, or have a, as a secondary object besides me, the audience, and my words, you know? So, um, and there's uh, many times when I'm re-watching the live streams that I'll see things here in the chat and go, oh, that's really interesting. I wish I had seen that and responded to it. I could be an INTP, but whenever I do SE things like boxing, BJJ, is that blowjob jumping jacks, etc. I have to repeat movements and store them in my SI before I can properly do it. It's always recall, rarely reflex. I mean, the only reason what you're describing there doesn't sound like INTP is it displays too much conscious understanding of what SE is. It's it's such a good explanation of SE polar almost that it's not SE polar. <laughs> I don't. I know that sounds kind of silly, but um, understanding the way that you have to learn physicalities to muscle memory before feeling comfortable executing them suggests a conscious relationship with SE. Let's see here. Next. He's a granite blowtorch indeed. Um, do you think an INTP should be able to recall and, uh, and easily SE as in boxing? You have some super faithful viewers. I don't mean me in this regard. And I think their loyalty would be respected by acknowledging them in a video series. I, I mean, I agree with you. It wouldn't be a series. I, I should, it's just something I should start mixing into the mix. Um, there are plenty of times when I, I think about it, about reading or responding to a comment. And I guess I just, I hadn't really considered the fact that I can easily enough do that, make little short videos in ways that are that link to a specific topic, you know, title it according to that topic, thumbnail it according to that topic, and kill a couple of birds with one stone there. Well, may, having something inherently be more interesting because there's a third voice involved, you know? So I, I think it's a great idea. I think I'll try to do that. Um, T.I. Polar wants to use F.I. T.I. is like the adult in the room spoiling their fun. 
Right. We're meaning what we feel and we're feeling what we mean. And your insistence that those things have some kind of binary element is really harshing our collective mellow. I don't think INXPs or INXJs would naturally have an easy time doing that, that but would practically get strong at it. I think that's much more true of INXJs than it is of INXPs. Okay, and I could be an INTP, but whenever I do SE things like boxing with them after repeat movements, and yeah, I already read that. Store them in my S. <laughs> Sorry, that would be a joke. <laughs> so then my SI4 can properly do it. It's always a very reflex. That's true. You want an ESFP to be irritated. Keep TI questioning them. I don't really have this with ENFPs, though. Well, the thing is, ENFPs will, won't have, ha, can successfully navigate away from direct clash. So with ESFPs, you're always going to have direct clash because they can't move their frame. ENFPs can move their frame so they can shift the frame such that what appears to be direct clash no longer is. In other words, they can accept renaming their thing Mia if it makes it more palatable to me, potentially, right? ESFPs can't do that because they're frame locked. Um, a scandal involving emails? Huh. I wonder what, what what happened. Breaking news. Breaking news. Let's find out what John Gruden did. Breaking news. Breaking news. What? He used a racial slur in an email? I bet it's something stupid like that. <laughs> it's like, God. There needs to be some clarity among people regarding the fundamental difference between Words and actions, you know? But I don't really know what the thing is here. Let's find out. Well, according to MSNBC, which is what you might call the mainstream media, according to the mainstream media, <laughs> he resigned... Just just days ago, John Gruden seemed unassailable. But Monday, he resigned. And the team was actually winning this season for the Raiders. He, he was the coach of the Raiders. Most critically, uh, this was happening in the first year in Vegas with their big stadium. But the New York Times revealed... Emails seeped in racism, sexism, and homophobia. Uh-oh. He used bad words. Okay. People, look. If that's the case, then have him incur the just consequences of that. Have him have a press conference and have all the reporters go, okay, so you said this horrible thing here. Does that mean that you believe meow meow? And have him go, no, I was just being an asshole. How about this? Yeah, I was again just being an asshole and projecting on my fundamental frame of reference onto everybody I was communicating with, assuming they were in that same frame and not even recognizing the risk I was taking by just idiotically engaging in that frame. Well, what about this thing here you said? Yeah, once again, just being an idiot. You know, make him stand up there and answer all those fucking questions. That's the just consequence of his behavior. Why would you fire him? His stupidity or intelligence on that within that frame has absolutely nothing to do with his qualifications as a football coach. I mean, what, what, it's like you respond to bad words with words. You don't respond to bad words with actions. Unless those bad words comprise a linkage between the, uh, okay, well, he resigned, but 
He resigned under threat of being fired, I'm sure, right? I, I seriously doubt he just said, rather than face the heat here, I'm going to resign. Uh, rather than face the publicity heat. I'm sure the organization said, we don't want to have to navigate this publicity nightmare with you. So you're going to have to leave one way or the other. You either resign or we're going to fire you. Most likely that's what happened, right? <laughs> I mean, the thing is, like, okay, there's plenty of times when, like, I'm driving down the street with Rachel, and and we keep hitting all the lights red, maybe, let's just say that, and I'll say something like, oh my god, these lights need to stop being so gay. Okay. <laughs> If you wanted to accuse me of homophobia, I suppose you could, because I haven't corrected my language to eliminate the word gay as a term referring in general to the shittiness of things, right? But you'd have to, you'd have to be saying, I'm going to lie to myself, to Eric, and everybody else about what this phenomenon actually means. So, the fact that I get mad at the traffic and say things like, oh my God, this traffic is so gay, does not mean that I'm homophobic. It may mean that I'm inconsiderate. It may mean that I'm uh, a little antiquated in my, in my slang usage or something. But uh, it would be irresponsible of you to attribute any kind of hate to me as a consequence. Now, I don't know what Gruden's email said. And there's a big difference between making funny jokes about misogyny and sexism and making actually misogynistic or sexist jokes or comments, right? So... There's plenty of times when I'll make some sort of jokes where, where I'll be like, well, of course not. Of course not, Winston's mom. You are a woman. I mean, you can't do that. You know, if, if you were to just take it at face value, literally, then you might be able to critique me for, for being extremely groupist or whatever. But you'd have to ignore all nuance in order to do that. So... It's like, the other day, I I made this video, after I had done the typing session of Mike Zulu, I made a video, I uploaded a video called Waiting for Zulu, Waiting for a Zulu, uh, and I put as the, the thumbnail of it a picture of an actual Zulu person in their native Zulu outfit, and somebody, probably, probably one of those RT people actually, but, but somebody put on there like, this is racist flagged. And I'm like, okay, well, if you think that putting a picture of a Zulu person in uh, the thumbnail makes you a racist, then, <laughs> I mean, like, the fact that the Zulu people wear these traditional outfits and stuff, and this is one of them, and the guy's name is Zulu, that doesn't make... Where's the racism coming from? You know, I have no idea where you can even gather that there's anything racist here at all. Am I a Zuluist? Like, I mean, it's just, it's just a, a cheap and easy pun. So it's like, I'm not a fan of of kind of frat boy culture, which it sounds like Gruden was exemplifying in a lot of different ways, you know? That uh, sort of chicks are for humping, gays are for bashing, different races are for making fun of when you're with the others of your own kind. <laughs> that That whole paradigm... Obviously, it's fucking garbage. 
Uh, it's a garbage paradigm. But it has nothing to do with your ability to coach football. I mean... It could have something to do with your ability to coach football if the parties you're dealing with, that is, say, players and other coaches, are offended enough that they refuse to engage with you on a purely professional level. So in that, in that, on that ground, it could, in fact, impact his capacity to be a good football coach. But until and unless that happens, I think there's... It's like, you know what's funny is, who was it? Um, was it the Oregon coach? No, no, it was Mark Few. Mark Few, the coach of the Gonzaga men's basketball team, got arrested for a DUI or got pulled over for a DUI or something. Um, and his school suspended him for the first game, okay? Now, let's say, in addition to that DUI, Mark Few had had, it had been a really <laughs> disastrously bad night, and he'd gone home and got in a big argument with his wife, and sure enough, she's got a big slap marker across her cheek, right? He comes out and goes, you know, listen, if this was my lowest moment, please don't don't condemn me on my the my worst moment. We we this is my worst mistake. I'll never do anything like this again, blah 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 blah. And then he gets suspended for two games, right? He actually did something in that scenario. He actually did something. And gets suspended for two games. Mark Gruden didn't do anything. He just said words that were stupid. And he said stupid words that were stupid in the wrong kind of way in this climate. That's not a good reason to follow fire him as a football coach or to insist that he resign or anything like that. It just isn't. Well, the thing is, lexicon artist, there is a a mob mob phenomenon where where people sort of get off on on their public outrage and shaming of others and the capacity of that to to destroy people that they think aren't need to be destroyed that are bad people, you know. But but most notably here if in fact you aren't a bad person and at least you're me, that will never, ever work. So it, it, nothing like this equivalent will ever happen to me. I will never get cancel cultured. And the reason is because in people who genuinely get cancel cultured in a significant way, usually the parties can point to... Um, can point to something that's pretty well indefensible you know that, that's sort of like the core build the core block upon which you could build a house of cancel culture the person has to have said or done, done something that's more or less indefensible and they have to either do a poor job of defending it or not defend it so the first the first criterion is not going to be met with me they're gonna, nobody's going to be able to find anything to meet it with me you can see what happens hi Susie you can see what happens when um, when people attempt to do that with somebody that it won't work on. Like, look at look at RT, right? Look look at how they approach the thing. They end up taking teeny little clips and making a lot of commentary about them, but it doesn't hold any water ultimately, because here I am still talking, making sense, and the, like I said in that in that video that I made yesterday about Eric, host Eric versus the other YT typologist, it's that there's a genuine slope, what's called a rhetorical slope, okay? It's, it's possible to push something uphill, in other words, to affirm some bullshit. But 
that doesn't mean the slope doesn't matter. And it's also possible to push in the other direction, to have another party push in the other direction. Things that are, like this Gruden thing, he's given them a downhill slope inherently because he probably did say a bunch of indefensible things. Not things that are just taken out of context. He's probably displaying that he's a manifestation of his frat boy culture and and all the bullshit that goes along with it, right? So, um, so in other words, he's not going to be able to successfully defend in which case he's going to have to do a whole Michael Vick maneuver if he wants to stay in the game. Like, you can't defend your dog dog torture endeavor that you were engaged in. So you have to pull a, a, you know, either a, a Michael Vick or what you might also call a uh, Steve Sarkeesian. Steve Sarkeesian was a USC coach. He was also a fucking raging drunk and was often drunk on the sidelines during games and stuff. And they eventually... Uh, fired him for it, you know? So he had to pull, uh, okay, I'm a different person than I used to be thing. It's a lot harder to do that when you're talking about a general cultural self-identification with. Like, you know, it seems pretty clear. Well, the thing is, he was. It's just that the cancel culture manifests not only as canceling. It gives the person being canceled various options. How it plays out depends. So absolutely, Michael Vick was cancel cultured. But what he did was he was proactive about it. He had a good PR team. And he did all the affirmative work he needed to do to allow him to, to have an answer regarding the cancel culture thing. Which was, yes, I used to be like that. And I am horribly sorry for being like that. And I did time for being like that. And I donated all this money to these causes that help fix that problem in general, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, I mean, I haven't seen the emails, okay? Lady Lou says, I love the word queer, but if that's what the email says, it implies that because of his queerness, he should not have been hired. That sounds like a good If, in fact, an email were to say something like, um, yeah, he seems, looks like he has really good qualifications, but during the interview, he revealed that he was a homosexual, and I, we don't want any homosexuals in this organization. And that would qualify as what you would call violating the um, Equal Opportunity Employment Act. Uh, so, it's, it's like, when I, was a, when I was in charge of hiring at Kudos, the first... The first person I hired to be the coach was a person of, of indeterminate race of, but with very dark skin. And the coach did well and won over all these Chinese parents and the kids too. And then I went, that person had to leave. And I went to hire another person. And it just so happened that the next person, a lady that I thought well, I wanted to hire was a person of indeterminate race of not as dark skin, but still dark skin. And the boss really didn't want that. You know, she was just like, look, you already hired one of them. <laughs> I'm like, this is the best candidate. I want to hire the best candidate. Okay, can I do that? Is that cool? Can I not worry about irrelevant shit, please? And there's other occasion. There was, there were these I had these various candidates. I had two of them come in to, to sort of demo something. And I was going to pick one of them. One of the candidates was a white lady. One of the candidates was a Chinese lady. And I had to fight so hard to hire the Chinese lady because she it's a Chinese woman who who's my boss, okay? A Taiwanese woman. And she explained to me, Chinese parents don't want Chinese teachers. They want white teachers. I was like, the white lady's fucking incompetent, and this Chinese lady's fucking fantastic. She, Chinese, she wasn't Chinese. She was American. She just, she was an American of indeterminate race with slanty eyes, you know? Um, and it's like, oh my God. What? You know, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to actually get 
quali- qualified people who know what they're doing and are competent to do the jobs we need done. And I get that you need to concern yourself with your your clients, you know. Well, parents don't want to buy that product, Eric. I get that. Fine. But the reality is this. Um, the way we've got this shit set up, they don't necessarily even know who their teacher is when they sign up for it. So it's going to ultimately come down to after a session or two, is the person good or not? You're going to get way more complaints about a bad teacher. Um, th- th- those, those kind of complaints are going to be way worse, right? We're complaining about a bad teacher is going to spread to other parents and become a big problem. I don't trust this because I don't like the color of that guy's skin is something that may eliminate some people from your client base, but won't be a a problem that infects the business as a whole because people will ultimately judge the teacher on whether or not they feel their kid is getting well-educated by them, not whether whatever other bullshit, right? It's like, and there's only some kinds of complaints that are legitimate. A person can come in and complain that teacher's wasting time and letting the, the kids run around or whatever. They can't very well come in and complain that the, the teacher uh, doesn't, you know, doesn't reflect enough light. <laughs> That's a funny way to put it, right? Because if, if something's pure white, that means it reflects all the light. And if it's black, it absorbs it all. Is that right? Did I have that correct or did I have it backwards? I always forget which way it is. Yeah, so basically it's like how much light the person reflects is really totally not a not a total non-factor in their competency. So I mean, I don't know. It's, it's people are stupid, but but they're not also. It's like the reality is the other thing is that my boss later came back to me and said and this, is, this was very, very unusual. This woman did not do this. She came to me and said, you were right. About the Chinese lady? She was like, she's great. I really like her. Diana. Diana Chang was her name. It's fine to say her name because how, there must be fucking five billion Diana Changs out there, you know? Um, but uh, that was gratifying because that woman never told me I was right about anything. And I was right about shit continually all the time. And she was always wrong every time we disagreed. But she never admitted it. We, she just... Ah, I was just like, whatever. Because, you know, I was drinking at the time, so... <laughs> this is the first I've heard of it. I'm curious to know this. Apparently, according to Lexicon Artist, in the Virginia school system... They have fisting classes. Fisting classes. Everybody choose a partner and put on your glove. Uh, I told you before, don't use that Vaseline. No, that's going to... That's going to uh, not be healthy for inside your anus. You should use this pure coconut oil on your fists. Okay, everybody dip your fists into this bucket of coconut oil. (laughs) Now, the down partner, I want you to squat, spread those cheeks. Hopefully, you all remembered to anally douche before this class, as indicated in the brochure. Ooh, that's a mess, Jennifer. (laughs) You've left quite a mess. And, folks, this is what happens when you don't anally douche before fisting class. I'm sure it's not really fisting class. I bet it's sex ed class now includes reference to fisting. Well, remember something, lexicon artist. What, but whatever the schools teach kids uh, about these sort of things, they are all way ahead of them. Okay? The internet exists, remember? I think nowadays it's sort of a... 
a, a ritual of a coming of age ritual that for for toddlers to see their first cocky video on their second birthday. What are you looking at there, Sonny? Cocky. Give that to me. That's not appropriate for you. But I want to see. Unfortunately, if you leave children alone with a device, they can see whatever the fuck they want. Unless you've got on parental controls and all that shit. Yeah, like that's going to work. It's like my ex-wife Candace and her rule that whenever Darby and Delilah were in Delilah's room together, the door needed to be open and they're both, all their feet needed to be t- touching the floor. Um, okay, so whew, we got lucky because obviously if it hadn't been for that rule, why Delilah and Darby would have, as a couple, ended up having sexual intercourse. Oh, wait, that rule didn't work. That didn't stop them from having sexual intercourse. How silly of my ex-wife to think that she was going to successfully prevent two people from having sexual intercourse. Who clearly wanted to have sexual intercourse with each other. I mean, all you're doing is making them sneak off and have awful sex in the darkened corner of some place. <laughs> it's like, do you really want... It, it's not. You don't get to choose, does my 14-year-old daughter become sexually active? You get to choose... Does she get humped in a bed or in the corner of the garage against some cardboard boxes? You know? Those are your two choices. Google eats babies? (laughs) When does Google... I did not know that. When did they release that news? That's it's interesting news. <laughs> Aww. What I'm wrong? <laughs> you couldn't be more wrong, sorry bra. About what? About wrongness? Sex ed would be a short class. <sighs> Here are all the ways not to not accidentally get pregnant. Sex ed class should be as far as as uh, as simple as this. If if you trust your girlfriend, pull and pray. If any in any other situation, condom. That's it. You know? That's sex ed in a nutshell for boys. If you're gay, don't even worry about it. Just do whatever you do. Listen to my wise words. Being too prude doesn't work. Being too promiscuous doesn't work. You said work, but I assume you mean doesn't work. (laughs) Being too promiscuous, however, works great. Uh, Well, if you were going to say it works great, you probably shouldn't put the two in there. It kind of like means demasiado in Spanish. Um, But I agree with you that it's not a good idea to be too prude or too promiscuous. If you adhere to the old world notion, uh, let's say you're a female, and you adhere to the old world notion that you're going to save yourself from marriage and the only person you have sex with is your husband, you are guaranteeing that you are going to cheat on your husband 10, 7 years into that marriage or so. Because you'll realize, oh shit, I'm 35 and I the only thing I've done is uphold this narrative that isn't mine. And I don't really know anything. And I have no idea if I, like, I have nothing to compare my experience against. And so, yeah. He thinks parents should have some say in what their kids learn. I mean, the school system in general is a fucking horrific apocalypse of rights violations. 
from top to bottom. Compulsory school. You can't ex you can't complain about anything basically that happens within compulsory school because we've already conceded that it's okay to force children to all go to this one place and stay there with people they don't necessarily want to be around. Since we don't apply that rule to anybody else in life but criminals who are serving terms as a punishment um, or potentially people who are in an active state of mental distress such that they harm themselves or others, those are the only other two populations of people we treat like that. I mean, if you're in the army, we treat you like that for the duration of your time in the army, I guess. But even there, I suspect if, in contemporary army anyway, if somebody said, like, basically, per party B is abusing me, they'd be, they'd receive a lot more responsiveness than kids do in school, you know? I mean, I don't think we should even... No, I don't think we should privatize education. We need to acknowledge the fact that... Um, at the time We are beyond the time for centralized schooling. So, it's like, because of the internet and the way it is, there's no way to raise a child in the contemporary environment that the child doesn't learn to read. So, one way or another, parents are going to have to make sure their kids learn to read. Uh... And they're going to have to make sure they learn basic arithmetic and shit so they can deal with making change and money and stuff like that. And that's as bad, about as far as most people's education goes anyway. How educated are people really? I mean, be, beyond that. Uh, how, how valuable is somebody's biology class in high school after they're done with high school? I Do I have some shared concepts of biology? Well... I might think they should be shared, but they're not. Lots of people believe all kinds of crazy fucking shit, you know? And the ones that are mostly shared, like the notions about evolution, are exemplary of how people don't require words to mean things, not exemplary of an explanation about anything. So, um, you know, it's like, I don't, I don't see, I don't see the point of, okay, lexicon artist, this is an example of people using words extremely poorly. But you know, they are changing math. No, not true, lexicon artist. And no, lexicon artist, that notion about standardized tests being reduced to non-standardized versions in order to accommodate the lesser abilities of the group you don't approve of for whatever reason is complete nonsense. I've debated this topic plenty of times. We've, we've had as a debate topic standardized tests. I have a song, okay? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'm going to put the song here, okay? I'll put the song so you know. The thing is, I'm genuinely informed about the topic, which means I've looked at the studies and, and the correlate data points and stuff like that. But, of course, the, the topmost critique is... The so-called groups that you're distinguishing the scores of aren't real things. They're, they're self-identification labels that are ascribed in conjunction with other socio-political things that don't link to anything actual. But regardless, don't even, don't even get me started on this shit. Don't, if you're going to say stupid shit, say stupid shit about something you know about. Or, say, or at least say stupid shit about something I don't know about so I don't have to just know how wrong you are. So I don't have to concurrently know how wrong and uninformed you are. Say stupid shit about stuff I don't know anything about would be much preferable. No. Actually, I might have looked at that one too. Okay, so first what I'm going to do for you here, I'm going to provide you the great service of 
four minutes of neg framework, the framework is on pause all right I have no idea what this what this video is gonna be like but here you go Here we go. This is, I don't have a lot of videos on this, on the debate topic, but uh, this is one I have on the debate topic. The NIC framework is comprised of two distinct parts. First, the observations. First of which is that standardization necessarily sacrifices individuation in exchange for systemization, whereas the alternative, or the opposite of standardization, it necessarily prioritizes individuation over systemization. So, if the apps to win the round, they need merely show that standardization is preferable to individuation in education, and that the NAG needs to win the round, they need to simply show that individuation is preferable in education to standardization. Uh, the reasoning behind this is twofold. First of all, to standardize is to make it such that you can compare between disparate individuals along the same vector, which is to say those two schools are now comparable, whereas with letter grades they're not because that depends entirely on the individual teacher. With standardized testing, now you can compare this school with this school. That's the principle behind standardization, therefore it's the diminishment of individuation. The second warrant behind it is that to argue that standardized testing is merely a component within education misses the whole point. Standardized testing defines the success criterion for the school, for the teacher, for the district, for the superintendent. So obviously it's going to define what success is. And therefore if a teacher is a good teacher but does bad on a standardized test, well they're not a good teacher at all because whether or not you're a good teacher is defined by how well you do on a standardized test. So, as a consequence, standardized testing is standardized education. Now on to the card part of the framework. The first card of the framework is the Ryan A card, and it's about self-determination theory. Self-determination theory tells us, specifically, that implicit and explicit motivation relate to the actual, are, are two different kinds of motivation. And that explicit motivation, the threat of punishment or the promise of reward in exchange for a given behavior, diminishes actual motivation or implicit motivation in all circumstances. So that we know now that by making the ability to get into a good college contingent on a standardized test, we make it less likely that a student is going to be motivated to do well on that test. In other words, the more importance we place on the test, the more reward or punishment we place around the test, the less likely a student is to do it for the right reasons. Now this Ryan A card has a second part, which is our second part of our framework, which sh shows that as human beings, our job is to do two things. It's to optimize social environments, and it's to do so for the purpose of maximizing actualization. This is, of course, most important in education, where we're dealing with the future adult humans that will run the society and be a part of our society. We're dealing with our children, um, and as any parent knows, a parent has nothing more precious in their life to them than their, their own child. Uh, I'm a parent myself, I know this. And as a consequence, it's very important we do that thing right. And our evidence and our case is all about showing you that standardization is at its core, doing that wrong, it's crushing the individual identity of each of these students in exchange for an ability for some bureaucrat to better compare different schools in different districts. We say that's wrong, we say it's ineffective, and we don't like it. And so our framework is, judge, whoever shows that either standardization over individuation is better than they would. 
We show individuation over standardization is better. Now, this is it's a fair framework. Twice it's as long as more movement. than twice as long it's as an actual framework argument would be around. And we so I'm trying to fully explicate here our <coughs> how the framework would play out a four minute framework. on this particular neg case, which critiques standardization in general rather than critiquing um, rather than critiquing standardized testing specifically. Basically, it's what I'm saying now, which is. We shouldn't even have group schools and shit. Not everybody should take the same classes. People should take the classes they want to take because of reasons other than just somebody's making them t take it, you know? That somebody's making me take this class is not a good reason to take a class. It just, it just isn't. Uh, now, here's a good reason to listen to a song about standardized testing, though. Namely... It's on right Standardized now. Standardized testing is good. Standardized testing is bad. Standardized testing reminds me of that time I visited with Chad. Standardized testing is racially biased. Standardized testing is no good. Standardized testing is merit-based. Yes, standardized testing would solve all our problems if only Every test were standardized, then we'd know the way behind the difficulties we face. Thanks to standardized testing. Boy, that's so true. <laughs> the point is, obviously, yes, there are people out there who try to claim that standardized testing is racist. That is... The problem is, of course... You're acting as though, um, you're acting as though, like, they're winning the argument or something. It doesn't work like that at all. Standardization of a test means, a sort, means something specifically, mathematically, you know? It's like, uh, it, in other words, it gives you a, a definitive ranking, necessarily, definitionally. It doesn't... So it, no matter how you want to change the questions, you're always going to, what it's going to provide you is differentiation between students. Now, as with the Texas sharpshooter, you can then go and draw bullseyes around every bullet hole you see on the side of a barn and claim you're a perfect shot. But it doesn't mean anything. Same thing is true of demographic groups. You can then circle demographic circles around a certain groups of people and say, see, these people did a shitty job. Find all the people who did a shitty job on one section and go, what do they all have in common? Well, it's mostly boys. Therefore, this is biased against males. Well, no. I mean, you can always isolate little chunks of data like that and be stupid about them. That's true. <laughs> I could be stupid about data an infinite number of times and never say anything meaningful. <laughs> I mean, Shaggy, Shaggy do Kale for, oh yeah, sorry about that. I'll put it back up. <laughs> I didn't mean to take it down. I just accidentally turned it off. Um, so, like, when Shaggy, Shaggy do Kale here says, actually, very credible statistics show ENTJs are now the rarest. What he's revealing is that he doesn't understand how statistics gain credibility. So in order for there to be any credible statistics about the frequency of a given type, the person who is determining whose type it is has to be right about their type. So if you're going to make a claim that's very definitive about that, you have to say, according to statistics about this particular test, as applied by these particular parties in these particular contexts, then you're overclaiming. And right away, that makes makes me suspicious of the quality of your thinking. The tests for schools are not for children in what they learn or know it all and about control and fall in line. I 
them tests are only for schools and for those who run it? Well, I mean, standardized tests are an attempt by well-intentioned people and probably intelligent people to to try to take back some some credibility from the hands of of a system that's empowered a bunch of little fiefdoms. So in a system where you let teachers teach how they want, you're going to get teachers like what Delilah had in high school, this his teacher who was always assigning posters, you know, always assigning posters. And the posters were things like, you know, draw a picture, draw a pictures of like symbols associated with this time period and stuff like that. Now, I guess it depends on how you look at how you look at education, but from from the perspective of education that that, that views that views information as something that you can sort of talk about in terms of quantity, like a good history teacher, the students will quote unquote learn more than a bad history teacher, right? Presumably then the students are walking away from the class remembering or having at their disposal in some useful fashion more information if the teacher does a good job. As long as you're operating under that frame of reference, then this teacher is doing a terrible job. Because that's not an efficient way to teach people facts about history is to have them make a poster. It's an efficient way, perhaps, to imprint upon their memories certain images that they all associate with that era for a long time. And for people who don't remember ideas much or care about ideas much, that might be, they, they might say that was a good teacher for me because I remember something from that class. But for people who are who have a good reason to be in a history class in the first place, namely people who can sort of understand, remember, analyze history. She's a terrible teacher. There's got to be a more efficient way to convey a bunch of information to people than have them make a bunch of posters. Uh, so, the thing is, when we talk about education then, we're trying to we're trying to address problems at the case level that need to be addressed at the framework level. There's no good way to force a bunch of different people into the same education suit. Especially when you're forcing them to actually physically go someplace and physically be around people. Well, I mean the thing is if you, if you aren't meaningfully asking those questions, Mark, what is the purpose of history? What is it what is it doing? Why is it important if at all? If you aren't meaningfully engaged in those questions, there's probably no purpose of, for you to be in a history class, right? If you don't think those are meaningful questions to ask and you don't care about the answers and you don't have any kind of good or interesting or nuanced answers, then there's probably no purpose for you to take a history class. I mean, the thing is, well, <sighs> history is saying, here's a part, here's a, here are descriptions of human events that can provide for us a common set of reference points, and it's kind of a map that doesn't change. Now, as we've learned as we've progressed through history, the map, the, the details on the map change quite a bit. They're, they're, they're actually, you know, people discover new things and or come up with new theories, questioning the legitimacy of this. You know, was Shakespeare really Shakespeare? Was he somebody else? And, and that's what it means to do research in history, basically, is to, to revisit those shared and purportedly unchanging set of of facts about <clears throat> about humanity as an identity that's not linked to the uh, phenomenological realm. So it's like none of us experience ourselves really as the concept of humanity moving through time, but each of us can relate 
our actions in varying ways to that conceptual identity of a species. So as a species, our history suggests, from our current perspective anyway, a general progression towards increased complexity and nuance and capacity such that um, ideas that convert to purposeful things for individuals on the ground, those ideas persist, even if the instances of them die. So, in other words, what history proves to us is that people don't evolve biologically, but humanity evolves conceptually. It, it, that's, that's the number one foundational lesson of, of all history that no history disagrees with. The only history that disagrees with it is history that claims to talk about things that aren't human and claims to make the link that those things that aren't human somehow became human and that that explains the existence of humanity. It's the only way in which human beings ever talk about history such that it doesn't necessitate that human beings don't change but human civilization does, or humanity does, you know? So, the best way to put it is, um, our species evolves metaphysically. That's how it evolves. Those who don't learn history are doomed to repeat it. Would that qualify as an SI quote? Sure. It's definitely, it's definitely indicative of an SI value because it's saying what we need to know now, there's a comparable instance of it from before that we can glean that conceptual lesson from. It's the alternative to intuition, right? Intuition says, I can intuit based on facts in reality now that, I, you know, that display aspects of a process evolving a certain pattern and draw conclusions about that that had nothing to do with what happened before. So, like, let's say, um, well, let's say I'm going hunting and I'm, I'm waiting and waiting and I see a deer in the distance. Now, if I'm an NI type, by nature, I'm going to wait for that deer to be the right, the best spot to shoot it at, and then I'm going to shoot it. If I'm a, an SI type like me, weak SI, I may very well, before I get good at hunting, have to make the mistake of shooting when it's too far away, and I either can't hit it or, or just, like, wound it, and then it's a big mess, you know? Um, or I may... And then I might have to also make the mistake of not shooting, of thinking it's going to get closer and then having it just get too far away again and then losing it. I may have to make both those mistakes before I can gauge my heuristics right because maybe I'm not using my intuition. My intuition is going to factor in everything like this particular deer's body language, the particular circumstances of right now, and everything that's linked to why this unique circumstance is not going to be determinable really by previous instances. I ha it all depends on this deer, this day, this timing, these winds, those whatever, right? So an intuitive uh, SENI person is going to be making a decision on when to shoot on the appropriate vectors, namely their intuition about all these, these irreducible factors and the singularity of now. Whereas somebody like me will not be attending to it correctly. I won't, I'll, I'll have to use some sort of heuristic or workaround because consciously that just, it would have to be an odd moment for me to really be sort of not in my native expression of being for me to switch over to that SE. And I think to consciously or willfully do that, I might be able to, to force myself into that state of being, or I might have a practiced way of uh, approximating it, but it's going to be hard to use it in an applied circumstance like that. So my way of trying to get into NI, if I, if I want to get into NI in real time, is to, quote unquote, listen for the one sound of one hand clapping. In other words, if I try to just listen for anything that might have meaning with my eyes closed, um, 
and I'm paying as much attention as I can to every sound I can possibly hear, in those moments I can approximate something like uh, a state of receiving readiness without ideating actual actual ideas all the time, less monkey mind, you know? That's my best way that I can approximate it. If I were to try to say, to describe to somebody else, here's how you imagine yourself in a state of N-I-S-E, imagine yourself being chased through the woods and you're stopped and you're, all of your attention, every shred of your being is listening for every, any sound, any irregular noise, anything that might indicate to you that um, the hunters are still on your trail or which direction they're coming from or something like that, okay? That would be the, the pure state of uh, N-I ready to S-E. Um, S-E ready to N-I would be, you know, moving very, moving through the brush very carefully, looking around constantly. That would be S-E with S-E in front, N-I following. Like, um, I'm going to, I'm going to act, but I'm going to try to stay as aware as possible to changes in the environment that might require me to immediately change my action course. That's why SE has to be both follow through and opportunistic, which might seem like a contradiction and plays out more with opportunism in some in some visible ways in SE DOMs than it does in follow through. Thank you for getting me this right. That's very kind of you. You're welcome. An ESFP deer would say, Hey, what's in? I'm not even a deer. You can't shoot me. I'm an antelope. Oh. You look like a deer. Don't You don't know me. You don't know me. I'm an antelope. Oh. <coughs> no, I agree with you. It's not a contradiction. I'm saying it, it's sometimes hard for me to explain how come it's not a contradiction. And I, it, it sounds to me, what you're saying here is, when I'm trying to explain this, you don't have any trouble getting what I'm trying to get at. But I think for, for types who aren't SE front stack, it can be kind of hard to understand, including me. Four slot seems so far away. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's in that that front stack. Well, I mean, I'm actually curious if you identify with something somebody said way a long time ago, which I don't even think I need to scroll up to see, which is basically, uh, I think it was okay in. They said, um, when they do something physical like, say, boxing or, or running or something like that, that they're aware of the need to pay attention to the physical motions to get them locked into their sort of mm -hmm. SI before they get comfortable with the doing of it. Yeah, I have to listen to music. That's not what I mean. Like, for example... What, like, starting off... Like, so if I were to be running... Well, let's talk about playing the guitar instead. Okay. You sometimes picked up the guitar on a few occasions and played yep. around with it. When you were doing it, were you aware of the fact that you need to get your finger to remember this? And you're sort of actively trying to get your finger to remember this? Or are you are you just having some other experience? Um, I'm listening to the notes first. Hmm. Making sure that I hit. Well, Usually I challenge myself by being like, I'm going to hit it, the beat, like, four times. So I'll be like, one, two, three, four. And then I get the fingers up here moving afterwards. So what I had suggested when I heard that the thing that previous person said was, and I could be totally wrong about this, it could be, in fact, the other way around. What I suggested was, that sounds like conscious SE to me, but weak. But instead, it could be conscious SI totally replacing SE. <laughs> so, it, you know, it's like, the question is, was that his description of his relationship with boxing more indicative of fourth slot SE or seventh slot SE? And I said, what's, 
Here's my, my initial analysis of it is maybe fourth, but um, that's one of those questions that probably has a clear answer to it. I don't know it yet because I've not asked it of a bunch of people. I don't have enough SI justification to give a clear answer about it. That's why I posit potential analyses that explain it from one frame of reference or another. As to that phenomenon, I guess, of it's now that I think about it, it frankly sounds more like conscious SI, right? I'm going to consciously imprint this muscle memory then as as a way of working around the SE part, which would be what Rachel's doing. Well, I know what I'm going to do, and then the doing, I'm just going to do it. I know I'm going to do this four times and then do it. Yeah. Hi, BB. Oh, kitty. Oh, morale. There you go, baby cakes. I need to change this aquarium water. Would you like me to host for a little? Oh, I don't know. I'm going to go to the But maybe in a second. I'm thinking we're pushing three hours. Um... Okay, so Legends Fall, then, what you're saying there, and what I've heard here, seems to suggest that that phenomenon of being really conscious about imprinting it on your memory like that is an SI conscious phenomenon and not an SE conscious phenomenon. Because when he said that, actually, I, I kind of identified with what he was saying, like... Uh, Hold on, I need to get, I need to get the feel for this. You know, like hold on, I need to lock down how it feels when it's, when I do it right. You know, All right, okay, that time I hit it and the ball went the way I wanted it to. So how does that feel? Like feel like this? Okay, feels like this. Feels like this. That's SI, right? I think that's conscious SI. Um, so I and. And, and it's, it also set, plays out the same way with uh, with a certain song. Like, mm, it's this part that I need to... My fingers aren't... Don't remember this chord yet enough. So whenever I change from here to here, it takes me a spec too long and it messes up my on beatiness Because I'm... My nature is to play the right chord on the wrong beat rather than play play a mistake chord on the right beat. I've had to train myself to be that way. Uh, in other words, to, to make the rhythm the master and everything else. You know, it's like, well, I may not quite have my fingers all the way there yet, but I better strum it anyway because it needs to be on beat. That's something I've had to learn and compel myself to do, you know. And I still don't have fantastic rhythm. I'd like to uh, mess around musically with you, me, and Corey. That'd be fun. Point. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to get Corey. That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's up to him. It'll happen some... I mean, the thing is, El Lobo Fruit, I've been playing for a long, long time. And sometimes I do play with a metronome. And also, it's like, if I'm not going to record something, I'd rather not have headphones on. Like, in other words... I'll play, I'm going to play a song or two here pretty soon. And uh, for some songs, I am aware that I have a tendency to speed them up as I go along. 
And I can always tell, listening to a song I haven't recorded with a metronome, whether I've been rhythmically sound or not afterwards listening to it. I can usually tell when I'm doing it, too. Like, God damn it, you're speeding up. But, um, but at the same time, I, when, I, I feel as though when, I'm, when I best execute a song, it's, it has a natural, uh, has some natural curves to it. So um, that can be accomplished either by playing with a drummer, where there's going to be some slight natural curves to it, or it can be accomplished by playing without any metronome. But it can't really be accomplished by playing with a metronome. Um, even if a drummer is metronomically bam on point, uh, you know, after you've played a song together a few times, there's sort of a unspoken agreement that you're going to drag the beat a little bit here to allow the vocals a little bit more room. And then, you know, so it's like shit like that. Those kind of little nuances um, you lose when you're, when you're working strictly with a metronome, which, at least for me, requires me to direct some of my attention to listening to the metronome in a way that drums don't, because the metronome isn't as clear and it's and it's root, I guess. Would you like to go out, Kitty? What's your take on intuitive versus intuition? Mm-hmm. Well, thanks, El Lobo Feroz. Thanks. Keep in mind when I say I'm still not super on point rhythmically. That's against a standard of absolute perfection. Okay. <laughs> um. It's not, it's not against a standard of normal understanding of that. I, I wouldn't be, people wouldn't note to, generally think to critique me on it if I weren't bringing it up. I, I'm comparing it basically against my pitch. My pitch is better than my rhythm. That's always going to be the case. It doesn't necessarily mean there's a problem with my rhythm. I mean, for one thing, I spent all of my guitar playing time as a rhythm guitarist. I've never been into noodling. Your noodlers are going to have the most trouble with rhythm because they they expect to be afforded the most grace with rhythm. So if, if I'm noodling around um, and I'm not exactly on beat, then my noodling is just sort of artistic artistic license. It's it's my personal phrasing that makes it so so like great to listen to or something. But um, you're afforded much less of that grace when you're the rhythm guitarist. You need to be locked in with the rhythm section, the bass, and the, and the drums. So, yeah, uh, I've gotten pretty good. But um, I'll continue to improve. And there's, there are different... Obviously, anytime I record something for recording purposes... Uh, like to multi-track, I start with either a metronome or drums because that's what you got to start with. I uh, it's if I start with a metronome, it's because I'm not quite sure what I want the drums to be yet, and I need to listen to it together without drums and then add the drums. Uh, but um, a lot of times, what will end up happening is then I re-record the parts after I got the drums. I'm not necessarily very efficient in my recording ways. Now, I wouldn't pay for, for studio time. Um, I have no reason to pay for studio time. If I were going to pay for something, I'd pay for somebody to take my my recordings of, say, guitar, vocals, blah, 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 blah. Like somebody be a production manager, basically. I give them all these raw pieces, then they produce my track, if they want to add a little doodly dads or whatever, that's fine. And uh, and they do all the mixing and the mastering and everything and effects and stuff. Because I'm getting better at producing things, but 
I know there are plenty of other people in the world who could do a better job than me. Are some functions time-related, other space-related, and other agency-related? Um, no, I mean, I think that that all functions are either functions of real time or of turn-based time. Turn-based time is basically the denial of the relevance of time passage. So whatever it is we're talking about, if we're talking about it in a turn-based fashion, which we always are if we're talking about it, we're assuming the problem's not continuing to evolve so as to render our current commentary upon it irrelevant. Uh, we're operating as though reality is conforming to our turn-based modeling. And for the kinds of things that we're talking about, which are kind of... With cognitive functions, it's like a permanent thing. We're trying to talk about... This is, this is permanent and implicit to all humanity and will always be implicit to all humanity. There's no... There's no hurry. <laughs> We're not in a big hurry because people aren't going to change in ways that threaten the accuracy of our map. We're mapping something that doesn't change. So in that sense, it's, uh, it's migity meow. So time space agency. I mean, first of all, do I think the world is made of three primary things? I mean, I think that if you're going to construct a taxonomical trinity for reality, those would be its three components in some sense. Of course, you're, you're rejecting matter. It always ends up breaking into four is the problem. So it's like, if you look at, at, at objects outside of ourselves, each of us can account for four different kinds of things. Living agents non-living agents, dead objects, and non-living objects. And that's it, really. That's all you can account for, whatever it is you're talking about, right? In terms of physical shit. Now, when you add in the metaphysical plane, you get, um, like, non, uh, non, like, you get, you get binary identities, which is to say, like, on off kind of things and you get uh durational entities like a youtube video you've got um i mean like all of the various objects on a metaphysical field which are built of symbols and language and or representations and or media experiences or something like that you can you can taxonomy those objects however you want but the one thing they all have in common is they aren't subject to the law of non-contradiction you and I can both be saying those words at the same time. And, same, you know, it, and, like, uh, this video can be both playing at your house and at that guy's house and 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 that guy's house at the same time, which would not be the case if it were one video VHS tape. Hi, Dan. Hello, girl. How are you? Good. Um, I'm actually live streaming with Eric right now. Yes. Hi, Aunt Jen. Show? I'm sorry, say again? On your show? Yep, we're, we're live streaming and talking with famous people right now. Oh, I'm so sorry to disturb, but tell everyone I said hello. Aunt Jen says hello. You aren't disturbing at all. We were just discussing, um, uh, discussing whether the universe is made up of time, space, and agency, or non-living agents, living agents, Dead objects and non-living objects. Do you have any thoughts on the matter? Um, I think this is a much too um, high, highly educated group that you're dealing with, and I don't have the education to do, to answer that. <laughs> okay, Aunt Jen. Well, but I am proud of you for having that conversation. Well, thanks, Aunt Jen, and I appreciate your calling, Rachel. Do you, you want to chat outside with Aunt Jen for a moment, Rachel? Yeah, sure. And I'll continue in here? Sure. Okay. Um, hold on. Uh, 
Well, okay. So that that idea that those are the three components of reality is sort of is actually linked to my theory on aesthetics, not my theory on reality. <laughs> I kind of just co-opted it, I guess. I must have applied it. So aesthetics, I think things are either you have the art of space, the art of time, and the art of agency. The art of space is basically machines slash uh, sculpture slash stuff people make that are objects, okay? And then the art of time is music. And the art of agency is language. So that's my aesthetic trinity, okay? It doesn't really apply... You, if I if I over if I over applied it in that video, I suspect it's more likely I over applied it in that video than you over interpreted. So I just assume I over applied it in that video and and retract my claims back to uh, it's just an aesthetic taxonomy. Okay. <laughs> it was back in two thousand sixteen. I mean. I've grown a lot in the last five years. I understand things a lot better. And I, I'm a better person. I'm more, I'm more self-aware. Like I, I'm more honest with myself about myself. And, uh, you know, it's been a productive, it's been a productive five years intellectually for me it's been a very productive intellectually and personally it's been a very productive five years well it's also a, it's also an acknowledgement to myself of the fact that five years ago i was talking out my ass at least 40 percent more often than i do now <laughs> um I mean, just, I guess, first and foremost, what it means by being honest with myself is over the, since I started learning about cognitive functions, I've kind of unavoidably been keeping track of things I never kept track of before, which includes moods, feelings, um, uh, you know, my relationship the relationship between between things you can plan to do in a day or put on a list and things that you can actually accomplish. Like, as I've grown, in the last five years, I've come to understand that getting a couple things done in a day is a kind of a big deal. It, it's, if there are things you're, you view as tasks that you need to get done rather than as just sort of by the way, normal being yourself, then it's kind of a big deal to get a couple of things done in a day. And sometimes, I'm not sometimes, usually, historically, I've, I've never quite put two and two together regarding my own ability to anticipate how long something's going to take or how difficult it's going to be, and my ability to want to do something or plan to do something, right? So, uh, understanding cognitive functions better has made me understand intuition better, my own intuition better, what, what words are, what they mean, what they do, and how I'm, I, there's a limited amount of reach that one can have with them in certain areas, how, it, it's just, I've made a lot of linkages between concept and reality in areas where I used to just be concept. And so my, of course, it's made the ideas and the concepts a lot stronger when you have sort of instances, examples, or mechanical relationships that can be tested on, on a, in a real way. Um, and in terms of how it's displayed as, as like me being a better person or something, I have a lot more respect for the responsibility that goes along with people listening to you than I used to. So I, 
I'm less volatile than I used to be. And I'm less at the mercy of of the winds. More, um, I'm just calmer. I would also say that Rachel has a lot to do with that. You know, it certainly wasn't the case that I was in a better place in the second year of my relationship with Kimberly. I was not in a better place than I was five years ago. But intellectually, um, the impact was more on redirecting my attention to non-intellectual matters than it was on I didn't go backwards or anything. If anything, it provided me lots of concrete data to understand lots of things through lots of different frames that I otherwise wouldn't have had the chance to understand and it wouldn't have been able to inform my overall perspective. So I kind of needed to go through that thing with being in a relationship with somebody who has BPD and, and you know, it's like after this occurs, then I have a real understanding of what it means to be FI polar. Okay, what it means to be FI polar is to let somebody abuse you, verbally at least, as long as they can provide justifications for it. You know, so if you provide any justification for it, well, then my job is to tell you why your justification doesn't work or to acknowledge that it's correct. And of course, I'm missing the, the boat, right? I'm, I've gotten off the dock without the boat being there. The boat is, hold on. This part you, we began with, you're, continue, you're on an ongoing basis putting up with frequent instances of verbal abuse. And you think that there's something that comes after that. like, And so I need to parse each justification to see whether it's legitimate or not. It does not come after that sentence. Nothing comes after that sentence. You just go, you can't, there's, this person, no matter what they feel, they can't love you in a practical operational sense. To the extent that you say this person is loving somebody else because you can point to loving behaviors, either speaking kindly or like Rachel brought me a, a Uncrustable or whatever. Um, that may say little to you about the complex and deep emotions that each party feels. But if you if you have the opposite of that, if you have a bunch of stuff that's, that's revealing, you know, that they have disdain for you, then that's, that not makes any questions beyond that moot. And so this is, this is about me having a sort of TI explanation for FI. You used to watch your videos to see your progress frequently back then? I mean, I don't know if that's why I watched them. Maybe something I gleaned from them, but uh, it is true that you know, for I, I've in, incorporated into my my general affect and display less jiggliness and less wiggliness than I used to have because I didn't like watching it. I didn't like to watch myself wiggling around and not staying still and and having a lot of unnecessary motion in the person speaking and so I began to curtail that and I don't do it as much as I used to Boba Fett don't don't provoke me I'm trying not to get provoked too anybody who says Trump is the best example of FI polar ever is and is named Boba Fett anybody who meets those two criterion is definitely just trying to provoke Eric because he knows full well that Eric totally disagrees with that. And I totally disagree with that as well. I feel provoked as also. And as of bringing you Uncrustables, that's true love right there. I mean, that dollars that's such an SI statement, you know? Here's the problem with an SI rule like that. Dulles has no idea that he just attacked Rachel. <laughs> Dulles has no idea. Because he's thinking, oh, that was an example that Eric used of Rachel providing love. And, and that's a pure, true sign of love. But if that were a true sign of love, 
if that were a real indicator of love, then Kimberly loved the hell out of me. She was always bringing me food and beverages and verbally abusing me in the process. So, um, <laughs> tell us, take it easy, relax. I, I'm mostly kidding. It's like, you're not really attacking her at all. No. It's just that it just so happens to be the sort of thing that when Rachel feels insecure about her herself in this relationship, it's likely because she feels as though she's not attending to those SI things for me enough. So, um, it's like, and being an NI dom, she's going to take away from that thing the general rule that true indi indications of love are the givings of food and then just view herself as being an adequate and inadequate provider of, of yes. such love. Yes. Such are the revelations of cognitive functions, right? <laughs> it's like we can explain exactly why she's going to do this and respond like this because I she wants to know that not just that she's perfectly safe, like I'm not going anywhere and that um, I love her and want to be with her and that we're compatible and stuff, but she wants to know that she's the best possible mate for me. <laughs> or in other words, that it's not a matter of two people who, who are mushy, complex things getting along. It's that she's the circle that fits in the hole <laughs> of my donut. Yeah. And as a consequence, nobody else, all, everybody else is slightly misshapen. So there's no possible way anything else could fit together. <laughs> oh that's what she would like, would like reality oh to be. Of course, that's not how people actually are. That's very much an N.I. Dom sort of frame yeah. of reference. Instead, it, it, she, it's like in order to prioritize that, you kind of have to give away some of the juicy part, which is, which is all the ex from an SI perspective, which is all the examples of compatibility or or can ongoing instantiation <laughs> right now of compatibility. You know, yeah. it's like be not Maybe thinking about all those yeah. things yeah. and thinking instead about the the identities. <laughs> So, All the time. I still, you know... There's a circle of light on my mouth. <laughs> There's a circle of light on In my mouth. When the circle of light appears on my mouth, then everything I say is worth double. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to get... Sometimes it, it moves. I, I'm trying to just get it to stay there, but I keep... It's hard to do. It is hard to do. Where is it? It's like it doesn't show up where my mouth is. Uh, it's paranormal. It's, yeah, that's not right. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. There we go. Ooh la Ooh. la. These words are worth double. It's really hard because I'm going backwards to the, the thing. That's why it's hard. As I learned as a child from a Shel Silverstein book... Love is being a cheese wheel with a slice cut out and finding a wedge of cheese that fits perfectly. If you think that's what love is, you are doomed to never have love. Because people are not just their shape. Yes, it is true. You can make a shape for each of the types. And have and Rachel's and I's shapes would fit together very nicely. But no two shapes would ever make a complete square. It, you know... There's two more shapes to make a square. So if you want to have a complete, complete whole human, that's at least on one half of the scale, you've got to have ENTP, INFJ, INTP. Well, it, like on one, on one, on one complete, if you want to have a complete meta. Meta analyst, you have to have ENT, ENFJ, INFJ, ENTP, INTP. Then you've got a complete meta analyst who's looking at all the communicative things from all the different angles and all the different frames. And you have a complete um, mapping expert that that includes the phenomenological linkage, but from this direction. Okay. And in the next level, if you put together those four, you'd get a complete analyst that looks at um, 
that deals with the framing issues provided it's in order to get and provided as part of how you get what you want slash attain meaningful outcomes. So, you know, I don't know what I was answering there. It's, I, I'm losing my, my momentum of truth is beginning to diminish. I'm decelerating in terms of my, my speed of, of word to truth or something like that. Perhaps the entire engine's breaking down at this moment. Mm. And my words will just start being random noises. Should I expect it to be paranormal at that point? Most things these days are paranormal. Yeah. You know, which reminds me, I've been musing. You know how on Earth we've got regular creatures and then we've got cryptids? which are creatures that might exist, but we don't really know, but we think they probably do because we've seen, they have a lot of blurry sort of pictures of them. So let's say an, an alien animal were to come to Earth and it were a cryptid on the alien world. And then aliens come down and we tell them that, oh, yeah, actually, we, we, we have some sense of you guys because we, we've seen and talked to and engaged with, in some fashion, this shaggy creature over here. And we describe it perfectly, and they go, oh, my God. Guys, this whole planet believes in Sasquatch. Because on their home world, they don't believe in the animal that's come to Earth. It's a cryptid on their world. So it would be like if we went to another alien world and... They said, oh, yeah, we know all about you um, because of the Loch Ness Monster. The Loch Ness Monster has come to visit us here on our world. We'd be like, the Loch Ness Monster did not come visit you here. And we can't even find it in its own lake. How could it possibly come visit you here? These people are idiots. They believe in the Loch Ness Monster is what we'd say. And then we just fly off and ignore them. And that's what's at risk if we were to happen to come across before a normal version, an intelligent version of an alien, an alien cryptid. So that's the premise for my new feature film, Alien Sasquatch. <laughs> <laughs> or How We Lost Our Chance to Join the Galactic Federation. Great title. Okay, Lobo Feroz, you bring up a good point. I think the, that we should first meet the alien Sasquatch as he attempts to enroll in a fisting class. Fisting? Yeah. Oh. Only to be informed his large, hairy hands are too large. And he would, he would change this from a fisting class to an anal wreckage class. And none of the fisties want that. Opening scene. Now, credits roll. We've set the table. He can't join the fisting class. He's outraged. Ah! Ah! And they call the cops. Sirens. He sees the sirens. He gets scared off. Runs into the forest. And the cops are interviewing the lady. So what happened? And she's like, it was, it was as far as I could tell, it was Sasquatch. And he wanted to sign up for the fisting class. And he said, well, let me see your closed circuit TV footage. And then she shows it, but... It, during this exact time when the Sasquatch is there, mysteriously, there's just a blank area. It just runs for like three minutes and then resumes like nothing happened. It's the missing footage. Where, is it, where did it gone? Why, why didn't it record properly? Well, as we all know, Sasquatches have the power to interfere with electronic equipment. If you didn't know that, I'll just inform you this news right now. If you set up feral cams and shit, they'll mysteriously stop working right when the Sasquatch is there. So, um... Do I get good ad money? No, I don't make any money off, off of YouTube, really. The only thing, I make money off typing people. Um, you know, if I could if I could increase my typing business, I wouldn't be so incredibly poor. But I should, and I could, if I did a little bit of work towards that, probably. I just need to uh, 
stick with my plan more and live stream less and make more one minute long videos. The one goes, brilliant, Eric, brilliant. <laughs> one minute of general things that are not particularly informative. Fantastic. Plus some praise. Wonderful. Just what we want. <laughs> general notions that aren't very informative, but contain praise of us. We'll watch that all day long. I just need to keep, I just need to follow the fucking plan. I'm not very good. I need some SE, I need some SE follow through. I need Legends Fall to give me some SE follow through. Yeah, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna hit you on that. I'll trade you, Legends Fall, I'll trade you three days of NE for three days of SE. Yeah, I mean, that's since 2000, what, 14? Yeah, so it was like seven years. 3 million views and 6,000 videos in 7 years is the slowest growing YouTube, YouTube channel in history. Yeah. Right. History's slowest growing serious YouTube channel. <laughs> because, I mean, I'm actually a serious YouTube channel. I'm trying to be a successful YouTube channel. I've been working hard at it for 7 years to the tune of 6,000 plus videos and God knows how many hours of content. And I am actually starting to grow. Surprisingly, I had a little burst here. It was a 7.05, I think, or something. That's great. Thousand subs, which is which is great. Um, so it's like, that's not very many views, really. And it certainly isn't very much money. I think the most I ever made one month was... Three hundred and seventy bucks or something. Now, and that was a month I think in which somebody gave me five hundred bucks, but they uh, they take a chunk of that, you know. In terms of just raw ad revenue, without any super chats, which is usually I don't really get any super chats, and also I don't I don't have it set up to make me as much money as it could. I guess you could say, like I don't have one of those thanks buttons. Yeah. I don't. I can, but don't have it set up for membership. Um, because I, if I'm going to do that, I want to make sure I do it right and well and properly. And I don't feel motivated to undertake to do that at any point. It seems like if you know what I'm saying, that's the thing people add after they say something. If you know what I'm saying, is a thing people add after they say something for reasons I will never understand. Kind of like a Rodgers and Hammerstein song. It always prompts me to say, "What? Well, what if I don't know what you're saying? Or if that makes any sense. It's another thing people add. I <laughs> went to the end of a statement. Outlobo for Rose. At the end of of willfully spending time right standing right next to me for three hours goes it's way better to spend one minute with you bro <laughs> oh no you didn't say they're way better you said they're a better way that's what I get for having word dyslexia Your audience engagement is good, though. Similar channels get up to hundreds of comments from a lot of different people, but this is more... Uh, oh, shit, I don't have the right thing up. That's why I'm having to squint. There we go. That's why I was reading wrong. I was reading wrong because I didn't have the right thing up. That makes sense. To be fair, your shorties are sometimes informative. More informative sometimes. Um, well, I mean, it depends how much information you can... You can consume and process. So for, you know, I, ESTPs, ISTPs, INTPs, even with dense stuff, are likely to put up to 1.5. ENTPs are likely to put up to 1.5, 1.2. You know, like those types are are likely to increase the speed of even dense stuff because they can process information very quickly and they can process a large amount of it very quickly. But for other people... They may be able to process information fairly quickly, but they can't process a large amount of it because 
they've got a small mouth, so to speak. They can take a bite, but then they need to process that for a while. They need to sit with that for a bit. So, you know, different people have different ways of dealing with information. <laughs> um, the way I, I can provide information is a sort of torrential, ongoing torrent of information that basically no sane person would want to consume that much. But the uh, reality is, at least it guarantees that however, however fast you want to process, probably you're not going to want it to go faster if you got it at two times speed. So in other words, you're not going to outpace YouTube doubling me, probably. So for people like other NTPs or STPs, it's kind of refreshing probably to be able to listen to something that requires you to process at full speed for open it up on the highway. But um, I understand that for a lot of other people, that's not necessarily how they want to process information. And I do have a, a shit ton of different kinds of videos accordingly. So I've got lots of short videos. I've got stills and narrators videos. I've got uh, comedy videos. I've got songs. I've got uh, freestyle songs and I've got multi-track songs. I've got debate, you know, lectures on debate. I've got um, demonstrations of speeches and debates. I've got uh, typing sessions. You know, there's shit tons of different kinds of videos. So it's kind of hard to compare them against each other. And note, I don't make very many of the kind of videos I like to watch. And when I do make them, they don't necessarily do very well. So, like I made a video about Richard Dawson. Why did he Why did he kiss all those ladies all the time? And uh, it's the kind of video I might watch where, huh, that's an interesting question. I wonder what this video has to say about it. Why did Richard Dawson yeah. kiss all those ladies? That's the kind of video I might watch. But, um, and it's done pretty well. It's, that one is an example that did pretty well. It's a video that I made too. And it's got good legs, which means people, people still watch it. it. It's not linked very determinedly to when I publish it. So, in other words, it still gets the initial burst of things and goes trickles down to almost nothing. But it's not nothing. It has a consistent contribution from search is basically the key. Um, and or recommended videos, one of the two. So, but most of the videos I make like that don't really, don't really do particularly well. Um, and some kinds of videos that I like to watch, I don't want to make because it doesn't sound at all fun to make them. Like, I like to watch 10 spookiest things caught on on closed circuit TV around the internet, but I don't want to go searching for those clips and dealing with the copyright issues and and just, unless it's, unless it's a story that I don't think, at least I've never heard anybody else do well on YouTube or heard on YouTube at all necessarily. So, like, for example, I would like to make a video of the sort I'm describing, about the George One and their and their crash in Antarctica. And it's the kind of video I very well might watch, especially if it's got, like, images that show... For example, there's a part of the story where the, the, the radar man is supposed to prevent the plane from crashing into anything by telling him, oh, there's a mountain coming up here. I can see the raising bumps. But they were going up such a sl uh, gradual and flat slope that... The, the radar never saw any changes and so never gave him any pingbacks indicating that there were things were starting to go up, right? In other words, this, the slope was slow enough that it was similar enough to things around it that it didn't register as as an incline. And um, they clipped it and then they their plane ended up dripping some fuel onto something hot and it exploded. The point is, I would like to make a video and I envision in my head a diagram, like or a picture of a plane going like this where with normal topography and showing how the radar works. Ping, ping. And how it shows up on the screen here. An image that does that. And then another image explaining how that wouldn't work in this here, okay? In this circumstance. And how at the time it was indicated by the military brass as the first recorded instance of stealth radar, which in at that moment in time meant a situation like this, okay? So I would want to... I would, I would like to make that video, but that would require me to make those images, which wouldn't be a huge pain in the ass, but would take some time, right? I got to find a plane and I got to find a slope and then I got to draw some lines and how much energy I put into it 
um, is going to depend on how good it looks. If I want it to really look good, I would want to uh, animate that so that the plane flies along the slope. And I could do that in a few different ways. And how I do it depends on how hard it is. And a bunch of other shit like that. Richard Dawson was fine. He was a perfectly good guy. He was never accused. He was not. He was not a like, a, a ass chaser at all. Not at all. He, in fact, he was in, super in love with his first wife. Yeah. She broke his heart, and but he said she did him the uh, immeasurable favor of allowing him to have custody of the children, for which he was eternally grateful. And he spent almost all of his time just being a good father and a host on that show. And he liked to drink too, but um, it was not an ass chaser at all. Was you know it's like people in Hollywood talk. He was not that kind of guy. He was cool. Um, eventually, he ended up marrying one of the contestants on the show that he did kiss on the show, like everybody else. And then after that, uh, at the behest of his then like toddler aged kid, he never kissed anybody uh, after, thereafter on the show because um, he he promised he'd only kiss mommy after that. So it's like he was a really good guy actually. Oh. Pio. 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 And Pio. And Pio. Thanks. Is that for you or me? Uh, for the week ahead. For the week ahead. Why don't you tell people about your thing here? Um... I mean, that may very well be the main reason, El Lobo for Rose. Uh, I mean, I am very often pedantic. I mean, I, I'm purporting to explain things, so that kind of makes sense. Uh, refuse to take good, intended, friendly advice. Well, I mean, you can't, you can't blame somebody for for having their own choices about your advice, but uh, this last bit, they start talk, talking down to people as if they're mentally retarded. Yeah, I mean, it's a problem. For sure. If, if the solution is success on an unconventional metric, that's not a good way to get there in general. It causes me a lot of, a lot of trouble. You know, I mean, the thing is, of course, the people I talk down to or speak in a condescending fashion to, they don't apply this rule to themselves, but they're not the public figure, so why should they? You know, it's like, um, people want to tell me shit about whatever and. Uh, I mean, I'm just, I'm not an INFJ, I'm not an ISFJ, so (laughs) I don't necessarily respond in a good-natured way. I don't, I don't necessarily, I'm not necessarily gentle in my pushback. If I don't, if I don't agree with something, I don't like something. I'm also somewhat reactive, like, I might read something in a certain way that you don't intend it, and I'll probably react accordingly before I double-check that you mean it that way. But it depends on my mood, too. Depends on how much, how, how much bullshit's been thrown at me. It's like everybody wants to come and and to the extent that you don't like that those aspects of my display. It's like if if that comes out in an uploaded video. I have nobody to blame but myself because I've chosen to convey that tone in a video that I've decided to make and upload, whether it's a response to somebody or not. It's, it's a willful choice in that instance on my part to, and nobody's to blame but for my tone in that instance, but me in, in this context, I get, I get a lot of what becomes provocation after I'm not responding the way they want me to. And the thing is, my initial response to it is probably not condescending, especially, or uh, 
or dismissive, my initial response is probably clear and decisive on the matter. And then it, if after that, I can to get pushed back, then it's just like, okay, well, you're not listening. You didn't respond to the first thing and you didn't answer it. So it's still standing. There's, there's like some basic things that I assume to be the case that aren't like if you argue something and I respond to it and it's in a way that rebuts it successfully, it, if this were to happen, I'm not saying this happened here, but if this were to happen, okay, and then, and then later on, you continue arguing something forward off of the thing you had said, as though I hadn't rebutted it, then that's almost always going to make me talk down to a person because I I give everybody the benefit of the doubt that we're both human beings talking to each other, like. If you say something specific, I'll I'll respond to it, not just ignore, not 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 pretend you had said something else or whatever. I'll take seriously your words. So it, it's like it feels to me that people don't take my words seriously, and then I end up getting condescending because it's like I thought we were both under the operating principle that we were both human beings and our words mattered but I guess it's only your words that matter you know? of course again like I said I'm the public figure so it doesn't matter um, it doesn't matter if the other person's guilty of the same thing that I'm guilty of I'm the one who's who's trying to sell myself as a public product so it's up to me to, to fix that nevertheless uh It's not so much that you're you're pointing out a problem so much, even though it is a problem, so much as complaining about an instance of it by pretending to be pointing out a problem. Even if you're right, you know what I'm saying? Did everybody get that? It's true what I'm saying there. <laughs> you know. Um, it's more about the bro and dyslexia part. Oh. Well, yeah, I mean, I did have word dyslexia there, so that was my bad. I'm sorry. Uh, I misread. Was that your comment I misread? I misread somebody's comment. And the reason was my fault as well. I didn't have this window up. I was looking at the little window on the OBS screen rather than the actual chat window. So I was having to be a bit of a squinty McSquinterton's. Not that that's any excuse, okay? I get it. I get it. That's no excuse. That's just an explanation. And explanations are like assholes. Almost none of them are good to eat. Except mine. That, that's how assholes work. That's why there's the lightning. That's Zeus agreeing with me. Every time the lightning strikes, that's Zeus saying, Yay, Eric! Pretty cool, huh? Don't you wish you had Zeus throwing down lightning for you? You want to hear the, you want to hear the sound of it? You want to hear the sound of it all? Here you go. Let's listen to it. Ooh. Now we're feeling the feelings of October. can't really hear anything, huh? It's, I don't know, it's not very loud. Do you hear anything? Oh, you can hear the wind howling. I, I can't hear shit. Oh, I must not play through these speakers, that's why. I get it. You're, you're only getting the audio on your end. Alright, I'll turn it off. Oh, you guys want it on? I'll leave it on. 
I'll leave it on for a little while. Well, turn it off. Yeah. I, I have no idea what it sounds like until I watch the video back because I don't have it set to play through the speakers here for that from that audio source. Um, but yeah, it was a pretty windtastic evening the other evening. Rachel and I stopped there in that parking lot to make this video that I did cut a 20 second loop of, which you're now watching. It's got the lightning over the volume a bit. How's that? Is that a little bit better? And uh, and then after that, when I came back home, I actually set up a video tape, a video with the phone to um, to try to capture lightning in the sky. But we ended up with an hour and forty long, forty minute long video, which Rachel and I diligently viewed through, looking for UFOs, only to discover that once again, and this has been the case now for a long time now. Every object in the sky that's flying that we see, we end up identifying. So we have this huge list of identified flying objects, and we've yet to be a, a, unable to identify one. Whereas if you know, if you watch if you watch a show like Paranormal Camera, it makes it seem like, gosh, it must be easy to see these unidentified flying objects. They're popping up everywhere. Not for me. Also, haven't seen any Sasquatches. No. Well, I've also been able to make a large list of identified landed objects, which is any object that you can see that's not that's not flying. But so far, none of those have proved to be cryptids, which is the only kind of interesting landed object is the unidentified kind such as your potential Sasquatch, your potential Loch Ness Monster, your potential real mermaid, your potential uh, know, Pegasus or Unicorn, your potential um, Shadow Person. Well, that's not a cryptid, that's a ghost. Yeah, probably. Your, your potential witch or... Um, I don't know if a witch would be a cryptid either. I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think it was a cryptid. What about, like... Uh, What's the, the rake? The rake? I think that's a cryptid, maybe. I don't know. Cool. I gotta poo. Rachel, can okay. you, did you still have those tarot cards up? Or did you already put them away? Oh, I, uh, it's napped. Oh, I didn't. I can pull it up. Why don't you do the tarot cards? Okay. Hey, guys. Me, Rachel, got some tarot stuff. You guys are interested. It is chill, Bill, outside. Um, what can we do? Let's do past, present, future. Who wants a pat? Who wants a reading? Who wants a reading? menu, tarot, browse, you know, you know it's going to be spooky, okay, so I'm doing one for you duels, 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 <laughs> can't, Sometimes the names I, I butcher, and I am sorry, I apologize. So, I'm going to do a past, present, future card pull for you. This is your past. Present. Future. So... Your first card, your past, is justice. So in in your past, you've been fair and just. Um, you might have been dealing with some legal battles or um, even like, like battles of the mind. 
um, or like karmic things, like, um, you know, things, you acting in a certain way and then having the karma come back to you. Your present is the three of swords. That swords is the element of air and it means your heart. It, um, uh, your mind, your mind has been hurt three times. Something stabbed you in the heart three times. <laughs> and it could be just in your mind. Um, you could just be feeling gloomy. Sometimes it's just a gloomy card or, or uh, like, you know, maybe your pet is ignoring you and you want to be with your pet, but your pet keeps like ignoring you or um, a friend was supposed to hang out with you today, but canceled. Um, or, or like, um, a parent said some, like, nasty thing about you and it hurt you. And in your future, you've got the hermit. The hermit is, um, all about wisdom and reflection and looking at oneself. And it's usually, um associated with like you know hermiting staying inside reflection on things so you might reflect on this justice that you've had in the past and why things are upsetting you now but it's it's nice to have the the um the Hermit as the future card too because it's uh, a major arcana so that means it's going to be a pretty significant time for you. So that's for you the duels. Alright, who's next? I don't know what I'm doing. Shoot. Um, who's next? Who wants one next? Lady Lou. Okay, Lady Lou. Uh, past, present, future. Past, present, future. Ooh, this is an interesting read. Oh, uh, there you go. Okay. In your past, you were the page of um, swords. Swords represent air signs, uh, Aquarius, Gemini, and Libra. And the uh, pages are the fools. So it's like you, in the past, you had some like, new ideas and uh, you were bursting with energy for those ideas. Um, you might have had even some legal things happen, and, uh, you were like, hey, you know, I'm gonna look that way, and you found out some new information. But presently, you are in the Page of Pentacles. So you're actually, this is a balance card. Um, it's all about, you know, having to give up one thing to balance the other, and it might have something to do with the decision that you made in the past. Oh my gosh, my SE fourth is showing. Um, and right now, you are feeling pretty good about yourself in your fields. You might be um, reminiscing about the past, maybe a little bit nostalgic, um, but you're in your fields and you like know what you're feeling, if you know what I mean. 
like you're kind of in your heart zone and no one can tell you what you feel better than yourself right now because you're the king of cups and cups has to do with emotions okay cool Boba Fett you're next Past, present, future. Boba Fett's past. Was Boba Fett, Fett present? <laughs> Boba Fett future. Ooh la la. Okay, so. In the past, we have the Ten of Cups. So you may be emotionally satisfied it's the last card in the set of deck of cups. Um, you may be very emotionally comfortable you're with your family, your loved ones. There may be children in the picture. Um, that's your past. You might have spent some time with family, um, and it was a really nice time. Um, you could even be feeling a little bit nostalgic. In the present, you are feeling intuition this is the ultimate intuition cards your intuition told you you wanted a reading and bam you got one you're feeling yourself right now your ni showing um and it has to do with mysteries too like maybe you know a little bit about tarot and you're not letting it on so much and uh your future card is the three of pentacles which means uh you can go into, you'll be like an apprentice to some sort of business deal. Um, you can be, you know, practicing something new and showing people. You have a new, um, you've been like practicing, like even say so, like guitar or something, something that could like increase your skills and abilities and you're showing it off. Ugh. My T E and at my S E is like. Bleh. <laughs> okay, wait. Who I I I don't know how to um scroll up. Who is next? Could someone do me a fave? And uh, tell me who's next. Okay, Legends Fall. Past, present, future. Legends Fall, past. Legends Fall, future. Legends Fall. Ooh, I just said, oops, I, I meant to say present. Oh, I messed that one up. I'm gonna do it over. No, 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 no. I messed that one up. Okay. Browse. Past, present, future for Legends Fall. Okay. Past. Present. Future. Cool. All right. So, in the past, you may have dealt with heartbreak. Maybe you've been in three significant um, relationships. It doesn't have to be love relationships. It could even be like jobs. Um, sometimes it could be like three projects that you had, like three ideas that you had that just like fucked up. Like just like you were in your fields and you were like, this fucking sucks. And then, right now, you are feeling your devil side. You are indulging in the dark side. The thing about the devil, it's a major arcana, and it also means that um, it is an indulgence card. You're also 
you know, like you're not chained to those this this thing. And in the future, you have the Ace of Cups, possibly a new love interest coming in, someone who may care about those feels. See that cup? It's like, mm mm mm. Here it is for you in a cup. <laughs> those feels. Oh. Jerry Bear wants one? I don't know. Oh. I just saw the word Jerry Bear. I didn't say that loud. So, um, uh, can I sit here? Yeah. So, I just told my dad about how. About uh, I was just saying to my dad, uh, basically, are you gonna watch the Dodger game tonight? And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, well, cool. Rachel and I are gonna run out here pretty quick to get a couple of more of these open bottles. This is empty. My torchy watch is empty. So I need to go get a couple of those. Bye. Right. And I can't start the barbecue without them because I've gotten used to starting the barbecue with a torch and not, instead of charcoal lighter fluid. Um, and I want to start the barbecue. So, you know, I was saying to my dad, so maybe Rachel and I will come in and watch the game with you later. And he's like, yeah, but... You know, well, if you want to come in and watch the game, you go ahead. But just, you know, I'm doing stuff, so don't expect me to watch the game with you. <laughs> okay. Appreciate that heads up. You know, this is this is the sort of thing that happens when I'm feeling guilty and want to spend more time with my dad and. Um, be a better son. And say, uh, hey, how about we watch the game together tonight? Well, <laughs> this is <laughs> this is the kind of shit I get. But of course, that's I, I, I don't know what my dad I don't know how to be a good son to my dad. I think you are. Like you're the best son for you're a good son. Like I don't. There's nothing that you do that would. Right. Because it's hard. He's a very. Um, he likes to do a lot of things himself. Right. And of course, the thing is, it's like, on some level, it's more comfortable for us to always watch the game out here because I can smoke and blah blah blah. On some level, it's kind of nice to watch it inside because I'm spending time with my dad. And on the third level, then, I appreciate him informing me that, at least from his own perspective, he's got stuff he's doing this evening that's going to keep, not necessarily keep him in front of the TV, which is, which is fine. But at the same time, it's like, you know, I, it's part of how, it's part of how we don't operate in the same frame of reference regarding SISE. Like, he knows what he's doing this evening well in advance of me thinking, oh, this is an opportunity for me to suggest something to spend time with Dad this evening. Which I'm prompted to think of because he's sitting right down there at the table eating chips and drinking wine. But, uh, you know, it's just... Uh, I'm not typologically suited to be of any value to him, really. Except for the fact that he loves me, you know. And being FI polar means also not being able to understand that I have any value, except insofar as I can frame it through some other thing in relation to this other person. Like, it doesn't make any sense to me. Like, how could that he for him to for me to understand him valuing me requires me to understand what value I provide, and I don't seem to provide any. 
Um, and, uh, and, yeah, I don't, I, it doesn't work that way when I'm the one loving somebody. Like, I don't need Delilah to provide anything for me. I don't need Rachel to provide anything for me except them being themselves. But, of course, it's a lot easier for me to understand even that because, um, Rachel and I are very naturally enjoy each other's company. I think both Delilah and I are consistently, with very few exceptions, if any, uh, thoroughly pleased by our engagement with each other. So, um, that makes sense. We, we like spending time together, and we see what's, what's good about each other, you know? Whereas, I don't, I don't think, like, I don't feel as though... I, I couldn't really say anything that I think my dad respects me about. I can I can't think of anything that I could name. I can think of occasional instances maybe in the past where he's been like, ah, that was good boy. that was good there. But um I mean I'm having trouble coming up with one of those at the moment. I, I can come up with one from a long ass time ago. Like when they the Cars on the highway came to a sudden stop. I was driving, I was probably like 17 or something. And um, instead of either slamming on the brakes or crashing into the cars, I pushed the brakes hard but didn't slam them and slid off onto the shoulder and went a little bit past this car here. And he's like, Yes, that's exactly how you should have done that. You did that right. I'm glad you didn't slam on the brakes and squeal and you slide out and crash into the people. You controlled the car. Good job. You know, I, it stands out because it didn't happen very often. He has his PhD in philosophy. His undergraduate degree... I don't remember what his undergraduate degree is in. So... Yeah. It might be education. I've gotten his undergraduate in education for a long time I thought he had gotten his PhD in education which would have made sense since he was in the education field but I think the way it worked was he just needed to get a PhD to move up the salary ranks in according to the county's contract with its professionals with its administrative professionals so that's probably why he got the PhD and philosophy, I think he genuinely was interested in, but he was interested in it from a, and from an atheist perspective, who misunderstood philosophy as being the alternative to religion. Because he still is rather, a, I mean, you don't hear him marching around with anti-Christian signs or anything, but he's what you would call, you know, a firm, unwavering atheist. So, and his sister's periodic. His sister periodically tries to save his soul, as they both are in their 80s now. My aunt Evelyn, who is probably INFJ, but possibly ENFJ, but probably INFJ, has been Christian for as long as I can remember, and. Uh, and, you know, periodically I take another stab at, at my dad. David! Now, David! It's funny listening to him talk. Uh, but he's just not, not interested in that. And, you know, in general, that's, that's sort of the spirit of seeing is believing. Well, I've never experienced anything like that. It sounds like bullshit to me. Radiation poisoning? I don't see any radiation. I don't, I don't feel like I'm ingesting any poison. Sounds like bullshit to me. And then, you know, they die of radiation poisoning a year later. Well, I guess it wasn't bullshit. Now I know. See, I had to experience it, so now.
do you think about the notion that without religion, most people will end up finding something else to worship? I mean, I don't, I don't think it's correct that notion. I would say that. Um, that there are plenty of people who are perfectly content not having an explanation for things that those who who are actively religious which is to say self-identify as religious probably that um, that those parties that it's filling some sort of role in their life, right? It may be it may be more or less consistent with any given map we might have of it. So, uh, so. It's like people people pray for different reasons, and and or engage in religious practices for different reasons. You got you got to figure that the core of any religious practice, in terms of the behavior of the individual that can be articulated by a third party, is the act of prayer, and the specifics of what the act of prayer entails uh, is a separate and more challenging map. But regardless. Whether or not a person would need to worship in the absence of religion is a weird question because the concept of worship is implicit to the idea of religion. That is to say, it's not religion if it doesn't include worship. It's a kind of exaggerated stereotype, and it's kind of true. Uh, so, in other words, if we imagine a world in which there weren't any religion, then we're imagining a world in which there is no worshipping. Uh, whatever you might call worshipping would instead be something else. You can't worship the tangible and terrestrial. You might go through the motions of it, but you can't actually. Would you consider be philosophy to be among the outliers of subjects that an NI polar person would dive into? Or something they would generally be inclined to understand and be intrigued by? I, I think it's unusual for my dad to have gone into philosophy. I think most ESTJs wouldn't and won't and don't. But ESTJs, being SI types, and NI polar means they don't really have a very clear understanding of how, of what a given mia is. Like, they don't really, probably, probably didn't. To him, it's just another thing you learn with your SI. It's not, it doesn't need to be distinguished from other things besides that. And, you know, it had maybe fewer number of classes than some other more hard major or something, or, you know, PhD. He figured he could do a thesis in it, maybe. I, I don't know. I've never actually asked him about it. Good night, Jonathan. I mean, I can, can tell you for sure, getting the PhD almost certainly linked to the salary schedule of the contract with the county that he worked for, you know. It probably had a lot more to do with that and his, his eligibility to get certain kinds of jobs in addition than anything else. So I, I can almost guarantee you his PhD had much more to do with practical concerns like that than they did with wanting a PhD in philosophy. I mean, okay, if you want to call worshipping anything that bows down to and affords official authority over you, then there's worshipping in many different forms. But if you want to talk about worship in terms of something you can meaningfully describe that other parties can identify, you'd have to say it includes praying to something that's non-terrestrial or non-tangible, right? In other words, some 
some execution of what's deemed faith, that is to say, purposeful belief, despite the absence of evidence or in the face of contrary evidence. So, is it imaginable to to separate religion and worship? Then, if you if you define it as that, not really. If I may answer you, if I died tomorrow and realized there was no God, it wouldn't change the Bible. It had made me so fulfilled. I mean, if you die tomorrow and realize anything thereafter, then something like God, right? Some, some overseer is providing you this time space in which to continue to exist after your death and realize things. So, it's kind of hard to imagine after death, any any existence of self after death without necessarily imagining some time space in which you can continue to exist and with no knowledge whatsoever about the specifics of that time space, it's easiest to envision it as as the arbitrary domain of somebody ultra powerful, then we don't have to worry about should I bring a jacket? <laughs> That's why God and heaven are visions where they are. It's so that when before we die, we don't need to worry about whether we should bring a jacket. Doesn't that make a lot of sense? Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. We're going to have to wrap this up pretty soon. It's 6 o'clock. How long have I been streaming for? 4 hours and 20 minutes. 4.20? Well, I think we're going to have to pull a bomb rip then. It's 4.20. Uh, At the 4 hour and 20 minute mark, talking with famous people paused to pull a bomb rip. Nietzsche's theory is that the oppressed used it to change morality. I mean, that's a that's actually is a very good argument by Nietzsche. I'm surprised. I've never heard the, the following, the preceding followed by the following. The preceding being Nietzsche has a really good argument, <laughs> and the following being anything. I've never heard that sentence being completed correctly by anybody ever before. But that is a very good argument. Of course, I don't think they. They willfully did that. It was, it's like it's. It was, it would be sort of necessitated by the fact that the only thing the oppressed have is moral high ground. So, what are they going to do? If if even the capacity to leverage change with that moral high ground is taken away in this world, then you can leverage it in the next. You know, you can leverage it against a common human moral truth that that gives other people pause regarding your character so no matter what culture you're in or what religion or whatever else if I say watch out for that guy over there he he will uh, put put poison in your drink and then rob you well it's going to impact that guy over there's interaction with the rest of the people around him. In other words, word's going to get around. He's going to get a bad reputation. He's going to have to move far away and start off anew and then keep moving and so forth, right? There's an implicit kind of, if you're, if you're egregious enough in your violations of, of community standards, no matter what community you're in, you're going to have to get out of there or be, you know, Yeah, religion does give moral high ground the last laugh, as as moral high ground should have, right? When when Christianity says the meek shall inherit the earth, what it means is the people who aren't engaged in this ongoing battle for control over everybody are the righteous ones. It's the fuckers who who are continually engaged in battles for for control over everybody because they want to control them this way or that way or the other way. Those people are the bad guys. So, um, and the thing is, of course, once you add in things like commandments, then you can articulate specific ways 
in which you have moral high ground that they don't. Well, what, what makes you think you're better than me? Well, I don't have a well-documented history of lying, cheating on my wife, murdering, stealing people's stuff, etc. And you do. Now, the thing is, for anybody who who has a TI, let's say, as an operational value, what are you looking for, the weed? Yes. Right here. For anybody who has like, TI as an operational value, what that means is they, they want to apply reciprocal burdens, which is to say they expect words to mean something, and that when, when you're talking about things, you're talking about them as conditional potentialities. Well, let's imagine that we don't go with the king's idea and we go with this other idea is a very T.I. thing. If you've got a king who's T.I., he's going to be saying, okay, well, give me some other possibilities, and he's going to try to pick them apart and decide. And he's not going to blame the people who come up with ideas that don't withstand scrutiny because, after all, He's not presuming himself first to be a knower, right? Uh, but rather at first to be a, a decider. And so, um, what then? What then happens is uh, is people this, these, these stories about the moral high ground, these articulations about it, these, this gradual mapping of the moral landscape, you might say, is probably a better way to put it. Just as we map the physical landscape gradually with physics, so too we map the moral landscape gradually with, with ethics and morality and so forth, right? Those things all emerge on the mapping level from reciprocal burdens. But they emerge in their up in the sort of phenomenological level as as actual loss, right? So <clears throat> you may have gained this amount of gold you stole. But what you cause in terms of loss is the suffering of this woman who's lost the lives of her husband and several children whom you killed in the robbery, right? So on a cost-benefit analysis level, just on that ground, the person is um, exacting a lot of cost uh, from, from those individuals and from the sort of security of society as a whole and attaining a little bit of localized benefit for himself in return. So it's a, it's a very, it's a fundamentally, from a just straight up TE perspective, a fundamentally inefficient exchange. And of course, it doesn't withstand any reciprocal burden scrutiny. Because if you apply the same logic that that person uses to them, then they have no expectation of not being robbed and killed and stuff. So anytime you get somebody who is in power but is a TI person or TIFE person, there's going to be a simple correctness to the application of reciprocal burdens that, that's going to continue attracting their attention, right? And so, even though they're in power and it might not be in their interest, because they're a certain kind of person, they're going to uphold certain kinds of values that are consistent with who they are overall, overarching, versus who they are in the particular in their position so it's like the ENTP who happens to be the son of the king grows to be the king is nevertheless you know may have been trained a lot to prioritize their interests and maintain the family line and stuff or whatever and kill whoever you got to kill to do or whatever blah, blah 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 but depending on the nature of the specific ENTP to the extent that they aren't defined entirely by that then they're going to express the ENTP's worldview through their projection of themselves onto their kingdom. And they're going to say, well, um, what they're saying here is fair. We do need some laws that apply to everybody. I am outraged by this aristocrat's uh, violation of those people and failure to apply reciprocal burdens here. Or, at the very least, on the technicality that he's doing things other aristocrats have agreed that aristocrats, even aristocrats don't do, then I'm going to come down really hard on that, right? So, if I'm TI over FE, probably. And and gradually that's going to lead to sort of a standardization of things, in which case people's, at least their words, need to uphold against the same standard. 
However, it could be that I've been shaped too much by my particulars, and instead, I just turn out to be an amoral fuck. So, it really depends. However, regardless, it is the case that the preferable narratives ultimately win the day. Um, in the long... You know, that... that just as the, the physical ecosystem kills all the mutants, so too does the metaphysical ecosystem when there's fair, open, and available communication between individuals will eliminate bad ideas that don't, don't withstand scrutiny. It just takes a long time. Because people are attached to various words for various reasons. And the moral truth of... It, the moral truths of the world are fairly straightforward and easy enough to map, but it takes a very, very, very long time for us to get to that point where we can understand it, because in order to have, a, to have us be able to say they're fairly straightforward and very easy to map, assumes we already understand massive amounts of conceptual stuff that evolved before us. So the reason it's fairly straightforward and easy to map is basically things that don't withstand reciprocal burdens are wrong. And there is no universal rule regarding what things that aren't matters of reciprocal burdens moral status are. Namely, positive moral indications. We, there is no way to universalize about that. And that's it. And that's as much of a map as we can come up with. Now, if we want to say, well, then how do you deal with positive moral indications? Then the answer is, well, if you, from my perspective anyway, I mean, everybody deals with it their own way, but from my perspective, is to have a uh, magical thinking frame and delegate that matter to that frame. I mean, look, already. It, depending on how you look at the world right now, you would either say, you can either say, like, the world's falling apart, Western civilization is decaying, becoming corrupted by meow, meow, meow. Or you could say, the world's finally growing up, and things, injustices and wrongnesses that used to be tolerated no longer are. And both are kind of true. So, What's, what's definitely happened in the last 20, 30 years is there's been an eruption in the visibility of disagreement with the standard narratives. So it used to be the case that the same people who informed you of, who, of what all the standard narratives were were the people who were in charge of admitting into the conversation narratives. Narratives that didn't conform to standard narratives that they wanted, that they were normally telling, they didn't include, and they delegated things like, that's crazy talk, or whatever. That's, that's not the job, Stu, or whatever they'd say. The internet allowed everybody to voice their perspectives, and the fact is, these sort of, these intelligentsia types who presumed that the story that kept getting told was the story that everybody was telling among themselves, turned out to be wrong about that. In fact, every individual who's hearing their story is building their own stories about that story in relation to that story and their understanding of the storyteller and themselves and stuff like that, right? So, it's not like with the interrupt, internet erupted this flood of, of misinformation infecting a bunch of people with a bunch of crazy conspiracy theories. Incorrect. People had a lot of crazy ideas all along. And what the internet allowed them to do was to give shape, specific shape and form to those ideas, to embrace specific ones, or, or make themselves heard about those. But it's not like prior to hearing this misinformation, they were believing the correct thing. They either had no position on it at all, or had just doubted it, or positioned themselves against it, 
Well, it just wasn't in the public narrative at all. It wasn't, it wasn't something you could ever encounter because they weren't part of the larger metaphysical field. In the olden days, there was sort of a qualification process you had to pass to get onto the metaphysical field, which is to say, basically, somebody had to see there being both value and a market for whatever it is you produced. That is, say, we had a piece of writing, a movie, or whatever. And everything had to be financed. You couldn't, unless you were independently wealthy, you couldn't publish your own book. It's still the case that unless you're independently wealthy, you probably can't publish your own book and become very successful unless that's entirely what you're dedicated to. Uh, and your book's really, 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 really good. Of course, with all this democratization of media, the bar keeps going higher and higher. In order to get to earn via merit people's attention, you have to be either more more pinpoint or um, or more perfect. You know, it's like being more pinpoint means I have to like. There's a small number of people here who've been here for a long time now, <laughs> engaging with me. That's me being pinpoint. In other words, whatever it is I'm doing, I'm doing it precisely. And so there are certain people who can value that because it's a distinct thing that differentiates it from other things. It's not appealing to a very particularly large group of people, maybe, but it, it has its market niche, so to speak. Small though it may be. Um, but the other alternative is if you want your, your say, book on your mystery book, which is a regular old genre mystery fiction book, to be successful, it needs to succeed almost entirely on its merits, which is to say, it has to be what Steve Martin called so good you can't ignore it. You know, that's, that's his advice on how to be how to be successful. Be so good they can't ignore you, which is by far the best advice you could ever give anybody about how to be successful. But um, but it it helps present to everybody how high the mountain is. To be so good they can't ignore you means to be notably dramatically better than everybody else which is a very tall order no matter how narrow the the lane of competition is you're trying to to go down you know <laughs> so here it goes uh I don't see the atheist knocking on doors saying, you are wrong to believe. <laughs> I like Dallas's rendering of that. Have you heard about the absence of the good news from our Lord today? <laughs> he had a so-called in there. Have you heard about the absence of good news from our so-called Lord today? <laughs> Excuse me, sir. Have you heard the good news? Christ is risen. Excuse me, sir. Have you heard? No news. Christ remains fallen. He can't get up, just like in that commercial. That's what the atheists believe. They believe Christ is fallen and can't get up. Which is a euphemism for dying. Um, but we know better. We know Christ is a lot more like an unbaked loaf of bread <laughs> than he is like a dead soldier on a battlefield namely he is risen not fallen what what bust out the yeast motherfuckers we are rising this Christ don't you mean you're raising him look I didn't raise Christ that was Joseph and Mary I believe who raised him you're right, yes. I'm rising him where we disagree usually, politics or the state of the world, etc., I attribute it to SE8. It's generally agreed that upon the SE8, either the dismissive of facts or the first objective impression. Chapter 17. How an ESTP derisively describes intuition. Um, your so-called impacts aren't so-called facts, okay? There's just impacts. 
facts are statements about impacts. So maybe you better leave that to the intuitives. <laughs> you know? You know? We're on site. Anyway, that's how an ESTP derisively describes ENTP intuition. Bunch of sub subjective impressions. Hey, hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. Your NI overreach is a fuck time more subjective than my failure to NI overreach. I'm the atheist. You're the one going door to door with the overreach. I'm not standing around going, have you heard, have you failed to hear the good news? Alright. <laughs> Whatever. I really like Legends Fall. You know, I like ESTPs a lot. I like Taylor a lot. I talked to Taylor yesterday. He's great. I just, I like ESTPs. I love my daughter, obviously. Um, Legends Fall, I feel, I feel a warm affection for him. Even though I don't even have any idea what he looks like. I don't think I've ever talked to him before. Maybe I have and I don't remember. And now he's going to tell me that. But I don't know. Regardless, I feel a warm affection for him. Which is a lot better than a cold affection. If you ever had a cold affection, well, that's just called herpes. Okay, I'm going to call it a stream now. I want to thank you all for being here. Oh, I was going to play one song before I left. Are you the guy who plays the guitar? The guy with the nice guitar? It's like, I mean, I know who you are from this dream. Obviously. I, you gotta think of it like this. I've met you so many more times in this context, even if I talked to you in person before, that obviously I know you as this line here with the, with the words next to it, not as some human being. As far as I'm concerned, all of you guys are intelligent bots with no bodies. <laughs> There's just words that come out onto this thing here. Oh, that guy. I've done a lot of those in my time, Legends Paul. I actually, I mean, uh, you know, you're, I think that ESTP guy who I vaguely remember. I don't, what do you expect from me? I mean, how, what am I supposed to remember about you? Like, that you're the guy with the big, the, the, the big ward on the tip of his nose? I don't remember what you look like. How do you make decisions on the magical thinking frame? Uh, it's not a decision-making process. For me, I just pray prayers of... Generally, I just pray prayers of gratitude for my general blessings that I enjoy and um, seeking forgiveness either for specific failings or generally for Whatever failings I might have committed but not really noticed myself committing or forgotten about. General amnesty. <laughs> Brain for general amnesty. <coughs> now you might say, Eric, that's not that sound like a very a very like, you know precious relationship with a loving God. And I say, well you say tomato, I say tomato. It was a hundred thousand million years ago. Dun, dun, dun. Here we go, ready? It was a hundred thousand million years ago. Time ran slow. Nobody yet to slow. So just slide below and let them go. They will start to grow. More years and two, and tears gnashing through. The holy slabs coming to view. Unchangingly true. Eternally new. When the slope appears in charge today, options at large, dear. Other ways, give each a chance, then once quick to check, but don't get caught standing on deck. The slope presents a fork, not easy stopping short, too far along the turn around. Perhaps the 
better course Was headed over north Now there's a fitter fort In a me ground It was a hundred thousand million years ago Time ran slow Nobody yet to show Plant those lives below And let them go They will start to grow More years ensue And tears gnashing through All his lives come into view Unchangingly true Eternally new Oh, when the slope appears in charge today, options at large here, other ways. Give each a chance, once quick to check, but don't get caught standing on deck. The slope presents a fork, it's not easy stopping short to power along the turn. better course was headed over north now there's a better force in a me ground it was a hundred thousand million years ago Okay, let's see if I can find the lyrics to uh, the old Cloudy Day in Los Angeles. Perhaps Richard would be uh, willing to sing along with us. Here we go, let's uh, go ahead and sing it. Now, keep in mind, I want to stress something. I realized as I was singing that song that Evelyn is naturally going to say, Eric, sigh. Sigh, your answer is not satisfying. You spent all of this time explaining how the reason you need a magical thinking frame is for positive moral indications. So, what you just described doesn't engage your magical thinking frame in that way. Well, that's true, but it informs it nevertheless in subtle, complex, irreducible ways that I can't explain. So, just deal with it. It's a magical thinking frame. Stop trying to demagify it. I'm trying to demagify my frame is to like, like trying to devagify my dame. Don't be doing it. <laughs> True. It's a very cloudy day. Something through the giving will 
try to zap your will to fight what whether I'm supposed to be here or just be soon forgotten noise is sort of based on what I see here and also on I brought up some old version of the lyrics that now nah, the lyrics have been simplified some. Um, okay, uh, everybody, be good, be good to each other, love each other, love each other. Oh, you want me to play? I'll play a couple songs I have memorized. Sure, I'll play El Nino. Sounds really out of tune. Easy problem. Somebody said that B to flat. rendition of that one it went smoothly and went well uh let's see here we go i'm gonna make a song up for you right now called well you tell artie it's him and me artie says you forgot number three it's him and me plus one more G, it's a trinity. Don't just think about God. If you do, then you've got a yacht in your chart. Instead, you've got to think one, two, three. Yes, the trinity abides. Holy Spirit by my side. Trinity on high. It's God, the Son, the Holy Ghost too. That's not one or duo, but three, dude. Three is the number which you should divide the Holy Spirit into one, two, three hides. Yes, RDO, he knows better than duality. Instead of wanting to make it one, two, three Because when I 
am worshipping, I'm worshipping in triplicate. Just like that, huh? Alright, last thing I'm gonna play is I'm a white boy trying to do his thing. Call me a rambling man, I do a lot of thumbing and the kicking canes, but I won't do an answer good to call me names. My daddy was a willy woodler, I wasn't born and raised in no kettle, just a white boy looking for a place to do my thing. I don't want no handout living, don't want any part of anything they're giving, proud and white got a song to sing. Well, I said a few things and I'll admit it, if you want to get along, you're the hump and get it. I'm gonna find me a wealthy woman in a line of work Don't take no diploma cause I ain't got much to lose and lost again You might call me a good time fella But I ain't no black and I ain't no yellow Cause I'm white boy looking for a place to do my thing I don't want no hand out living Don't want any bird or anything they giving I'm proud and white and got a song to sing Well I said a few things and I'll admit it If you wanna get ahead you gotta hump and get it Just a white boy looking for a place to do my thing I've really been around a little and I like guitar and I like the fiddle cause that's the kind of soul to defend my plan. Blue I've been feared and ready, I got to work just to be somebody, I'm a white boy looking to the place to do my thing. I don't want no hand out living, don't want any part of anything they're giving, proud and white and got a song to sing. Well I said a few things and I'll admit it, if you want to get ahead you gotta hump and get it, just a white boy looking for a place to do my thing. I said a few things and I'll admit it. If you won't get a hitch, you gotta hump and get it. Just a white boy looking for a place to do my thing. Well, I said a few things and I'll admit it. If you wanna get a hitch, you gotta hump and get it. Just a white boy looking for a place to do my thing. Well, I said a few things and I'll admit it. If you wanna get a hitch, you gotta hump and get it. Just a white boy looking for a place to do my thing. Thank you, darling. That was not one of my better planes of that. I didn't really nail it or anything. But, you know, that's what happens when you're five hours into a stream. You get a little bit tired, your voice is a little shot. You start thinking, hmm, maybe today has something other than this in store for me. Wow. Maybe, who knows? Maybe. All right. That's it. Thanks, everybody. Pleasure being here with you today. You were a lot of fun. Thanks for being such wonderful guests here on the Talking with Fantasy People Hour, which stretched five hours today. Uh, you know, there really is not a better audience in all of television. Give yourselves a hand, folks. Give yourselves a hand. We are so lucky here on The Price is Right. We have the best audience in television. Wait, this isn't The Price is Right? But... Just some YouTube channel? Never mind. I was told I was going to be on the prices, right? 